it's not great for people to get overwhelmed with a TV show on Fix and Flip where you're talking about hard money. There's words that they eradicated from our, our um, vocabulary. We say primary bedroom. We can't say master anymore. Why? Oh, like slave stuff? Slave stuff. So master <laughs> master bedroom, master bathroom. So what would happen is we would have, this was like that 0.1%. Yeah. People would come through the house authentically. All of it's authentic. And then on camera, they would go, man, the master bathroom is gorgeous. We would have to stop and go, we need you to say that again, but you have to say primary bath. Just think about the real estate process as a whole. Like, why does it take 30 days to get a loan? Or <laughs> Jamil just got a loan on his beach house, took six months. Why? Why? So, let, yeah, if you're a lender, it's like, how do you speed up that process? And do you think it's because of the new technology? I think it's, technology? a lot of it is paperwork. Yeah. I think like most of what takes a loan so long is this guy's underwriting this, then that, then this. It's like, dude, if you have financials ready to go, you get the financials in the system, you get an appraisal, what else is needed, right? How does it take 30 days? What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of The Ryan Pineda Show. Today, I've got one of my buddies from Arizona. I got a lot of buddies out in Arizona. Yeah, you do. But uh, this one has been doing some crazy things the last two years. Um, it's funny, man. We were doing a meetup about two years ago. Yes. This time. Yeah, yeah. And uh, now just to see where both of our lives have, have gone since then is, is kind of mind-blowing. For those of you who don't know, I've got uh, my friend Pace Morby on today. He is the king of creative finance and sub two. He also just launched his brand new TV show, Triple Digit Flip. And uh, we were just talking pre-show. He's doing a bunch of other stuff. So, man, it's good to have you on. Bro, thank you so much. I was watching one of your most recent episodes with one of your buddies in, in, in your Bible study group. Oh, my gosh, this podcast is so stinking good. Yeah. I literally send all of my team your stuff, and I'm like, guys, watch this. Watch this. Go to minute <laughs> seven. Go to minute 12. Oh, my gosh, Ryan just said this. I, I'm, I'm very lucky to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah, dude. He's uh, talking about John Acuff. So if you guys haven't seen that episode. Phenomenal. We'll One of the best podcasts I've probably ever listened to, ever. It was unbelievable. Yeah, dude. He came up with so many nuggets during that. And uh, Gabe, who is managing the Switch right now, he got we got done with the podcast. He was like, dude, that was crazy. What was so good about <laughs> that, beyond the content, is that obviously he's incredibly intelligent, he's articulate, but he spun everything back to you regarding baseball. The guy's a master storyteller. Yeah. He's phenomenal. You can tell he's great on stage, but he's practiced and he's honed. And what was interesting is listening to his origin story about how he actually couldn't finish anything, which is why he wrote the book Finish. Yeah. And I'm like, this is what people need to hear. People need to hear the origin story of these superheroes, like where people came from and how they ultimately got into their position. Because so many other people are fearful of like, oh, I, I could never do what Acuff does. Yeah, you know, no, 100%. And for those who don't know, that he's written, I think, eight books now and New York Times bestseller multiple times. So Phenomenal. Let's go over your origin story real quick to spin it a little bit, man. So, yeah. I mean, you're hosting a TV show. You've got this huge community. You've done all these real estate deals like... How'd you get here? I got here from being in a blue collar family. Growing up, um, my father was a contractor. I learned basically that's the way you make money. My parents had 12 kids. So my dad, even though he was um, trained CPA and you know did people's books and Rockford Fosgate, the speaker company, my dad was the CFO of that company, but still couldn't make enough money with a really high paying job. Mm -hmm. So he would do contracting on the side. And then my dad realized, oh, well, I can make way more money as a contractor than I ever could being a corporate CFO, even for Rockford freaking Fosgate. Isn't that crazy? Like it's you're so managing crazy. the money. Yes. And like you're having trouble like keeping the money. Right. And my parents got to a point where they had 12 kids. We're Mormons, so Mormons. Whoa, I did not know you had <laughs> 12 kids. Yeah, I'm numbered three. There's nine siblings underneath me. Nine. Wow. I've changed more diapers than most people who have kids have changed diapers. All right. <laughs> so okay, I did not know that about I you. I grew up um, in that household, and I just learned to work with my hands. And unfortunately, because of the way that I was taught, I'm glad I, I learned how to work really, really hard. Um, but I learned to work with my hands. So I couldn't wrap my head around any other business other than produ you know, trade your time, get money. Mm -hmm. And it led me down the path of construction. I ended up utilizing social media, which you are the freaking best at this, unbelievable at it. Um, I started utilizing social media in my construction company before and afters, before and afters, and I would land all of my construction jobs through my Instagram. Literally everything came through my Instagram. What year was this? 2010. Okay. Okay. And what ended up happening is um, I get the attention of Open Door and OfferPad and Zillow. 
And I end up getting phone calls from them saying, hey, we're launching in Phoenix. We need a contractor. I ended up being the second contractor that Open Door ever hired when they opened up their market. Mm. Phoenix was their first market. Now, by 2000, this is now by like 2015. Um, I now have 185 employees. We're doing $20 million a year in construction, and I'm taking home millions of dollars. Like amazing, amazing lifestyle. Then what happens, I go open up Dallas for them. I open Vegas for them. And then I get a phone call from one of the heads at Open Door, and they go, hey, we have good news and bad news. Come into our office. And the good news is they go, hey, here's a $100,000 check. Thank you for everything you've done. But we're taking, here's the bad news. We're taking our average renovation from $50,000 a house to like $1,500 a house. Good move by them, by the way. Amazing move by them. <laughs> but not a great move for me because I had staked and put all my eggs in that basket, right? I wasn't a great business owner in that regard of like, you need to be diversified. What I found is like, there's a lot of money working for these funds because they care more about having credible, good contractors doing their jobs and they care about pinching every penny and they paid every Friday. Mm. And they, what happened is I had 185 employees, like 160 of them were dedicated to the funds. So I go, okay, I need a couple of months. And I started moving my... Um, cruise to local fix and flippers. And I started working for local fl fix and flippers and home renovations and stuff like that. And what happened is in 2016, 2015, 16, I figured out what wholesaling was. So I bought a Homevestors franchise. I don't know if you ever knew that. Yeah, I, I remember the Homevestors. You told me that. So I bought a Homevestors franchise. So I started wholesaling about 10 deals a month with my wife and I. And I was doing my renovation company at the same time. And looking back, I should have just let go of my construction company and focused all on re, uh, real estate. But I was so broken in the brain that I was like, this is too good to be true. So tell me this before you, you go on. As a guy who already had the construction piece down, you had a, you know, a company. Why didn't you just fix and flip? Why wholesale? So interesting. The funding. You just didn't have the money. It's not that I didn't have the money. It's that I didn't. I couldn't compute how the money all flowed, right? I never had anybody, what was happening. You didn't happening. understand how to do cash flows or anything. Yet. Right. I didn't understand any of that stuff. I knew payroll. And here's the challenge too in, in, in construction is that you'll have a quarter million dollar payroll every two weeks and then somebody fails to pay you and you've got all now your you're cash. Screwed. You're screwed for 30 days until right. you can figure out your cash flow. So I would look at that and go, man, if I have one bad month where somebody doesn't pay me and I got to wait 30 days or something along those lines, I worked for, for a lot of insurance companies too, and they slow pay and they do all this weird stuff. And I go, if I put myself in a position where I, I've got money invested in a house, I didn't understand freaking hard money. <laughs> Isn't it crazy? Yeah. Like you were, you were talking to um, Bradley the other day about like, Bradley asked you the question. He goes, why don't real estate agents do this? You're like, Brad, they just don't know what we know. Yeah. And I was a contractor at a very, very high level doing a lot of jobs for big companies. And I still couldn't put a couple of very basic pieces together. And if I could go back in a time machine, I would yell at myself and go, you, <laughs> dude, you have everything in front of you. One, one thing I'll say, too, is and this is uh, for both of us, a good reminder is like, dude, people could be hearing this podcast for the very first time mm -hmm. and have never heard of hard money right. or anything. Right. So it's like. I, I always have to remind myself, like, dude, I need to speak as if nobody has ever heard what I've said before. Right. Even though I've said it third grader, 800 million times, I need to make sure that, hey, people, like, this could change somebody's life. And so, like, for those listening, when we talk about hard money, we're saying that, hey, there are lenders out there, you can Google them, just hard money lenders, who will lend you on your fix and flips if right. you have a good deal. Like, finding the money is probably the easiest Part Isn't of, that the ironic estate. part about it is that that now is the easiest part of the entire deal. Yeah. Getting the money is the easiest. The hardest part is managing, especially at your level, because you're flipping way more than I am. I'm We're flipping probably 15 to 18 projects at a time. I think last time I saw you were flipping like 50 to 60 active yeah. projects. You're like 4X what I do. The hardest part is managing the project. It's yeah. not the construction money. sucks. Yeah, construction's <laughs> really, really challenging. Yeah. I bro, I had that figured out. We did I did close to seven thousand turns for hedge funds. Seven thousand. Yeah. And that's why I was like, man, why didn't you just buy them? <laughs> that's exactly it. So the, the basic principle of this, guys, um, for everybody that may be listening to this for the first time, I had the hardest part of this figured out, but I had the lit the smallest thing. If somebody told me, for example, um, one of my hard money lenders that we use is they're just local to Arizona, but you guys can Google them and use them if you're in Arizona. Frank West Capital. They'll fund 100% of your purchase. Mm -hmm. they'll, clo they'll even pay for the closing costs. Yeah. Frank West Capital, they'll fund 100% of it. Then for the renovation budget, I could go to like mom and dad. I could go to a credit card company. One There's of your 12 brothers and one sisters. One of my 12 brothers and sisters. <laughs> um, 
Or there's companies out there like Plastique. Have you ever, do you ever teach people to use Plastique? I've heard of it. So basically, you it. take a credit card and you swipe it online. Oh, and they'll give you cash. And they give you cash. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. like you can take an American Express. Like I have a Platinum, and I could go. I want a hundred grand. I could swipe it on Plastique, and they'll send me a, a, a freaking check for a hundred grand. Yeah. It's crazy. If somebody would have told me that back in 2015 and 16, I, it would have changed my life. That's actually how I got started flipping houses, but there was no plastique back then. I just had the credit cards and- uh, You were paying for like renovation budgets and stuff no, like that? so like I just did a balance transfer to oh, a check. Love it. And uh, that was how I got the money to put a down payment. Is, isn't it funny how basic that really, really is, but people have a hard time believing you can fix and flip without any of your own money? Yeah, I mean, that- I, it definitely wasn't my money, but right. you know, I was on the hook for it. Right. There, well, there you go. So <laughs> yeah. with hard money lenders, so like we use um, myinvestorloan.com. We use them a lot for like our purchases. We use Frank West Capital, who's only local to Arizona. But you Google it, guys, you will find thousands of lenders. Yep. Thousands. Yeah, they're everywhere. They're everywhere. They're institutions. They literally build a business just to give you guys money. That's how prevalent they are, right? So I didn't have that element. And I was fearful of my cash flow situation. No matter how much money you're making, it's like one day I have eight hundred thousand dollars in the account, and the next day I'm wondering how am I going to pay for yeah. groceries. Right? I mean, it still happens today. Right. I two months ago I was texting Donovan Ruffin, friend of both of ours, and I was texting him because a, a couple of years ago he would brag like I bring my account down to zero every single month because I'm reinvesting, and I was like, bro, I literally have a negative like eight hundred dollars in my bank account. <laughs> I need to like go transfer money from a whatever. So, um, anyway, what happens is. I buy a home investors franchise because one of my clients who I was fixing and flipping houses for owned a franchise. Her name was Bethany. Shout out Bethany. She changed my life. She said, you, you're the hardest working person I've ever met. Why are you not flipping your own houses? Oh, Bethany, you are the smartest person. I'm so grateful for her. <laughs> so I go, well, I am flipping houses. She goes, no, no, no. You're making like one tenth of what I'm making. Yeah. You know, and you actually are doing all the hard work. Do you see me coming to the job site? I go, no, you're doing all the hard work pace. I found the deal. I funded the deal. You did all the work. I'm like, oh my gosh. So she says, I'm retiring. I will sell you my ter my Phoenix territory. I ended up buying her territory and I go, okay, I don't even know what I'm doing. So I, Homevestors, their primary source of marketing is direct mail, PPC, some SEO and some billboards, right? Right. Arch a little bit archaic stuff. And I get, I spend $5,000 on marketing my first month and I make 50 grand. Mm. And You're I'm like, this is tight. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> so I didn't even know what an assignment contract was. I didn't know what any of that stuff was. Jamil, back in the day, is the guy I sold my first deal to. And he walked me through and taught me what an assignment contract was. Mm. Okay. So this is like 2015, 2016. I was transitioning. I had my construction company and wholesale. What happens is Open Door comes to me and they go, okay, we're going to shut down a lot of our stuff. We're going to bring stuff in-house. We're going to start doing our renovations in-house. We're going to bring in some handyman, and we're not going to need you and the other contractors in about three months. So I start transitioning my crews. If I knew any better, what I should have done is I should have just full-time flipped my own houses. It was stupid. What I did is I was taking my money that I was making from wholesaling and I then started funding my construction company and the way I built clients. This is the dumbest thing I've ever done. Maybe one of the smartest things I've ever done. I started finding clients by saying, I will fund your fix and flips with my money. Mm. I will fund your renovation. You buy the deal with your hard money lender. I will fund the construction. You pay me when you sell the house. And that's how I was billing my clientele. Okay. That, how, how do you think that ended? <laughs> they didn't pay you. They didn't pay me. I had one guy owed me a million. Another guy owed me 600000 Another guy owed me $180,000. All in all, I lost a couple of million dollars. And when that happened, my um, I was starting to do sub two. I was starting to do seller finance, creative finance stuff, which may, we might get into later. If you guys want to know more about it, you guys can always go look some of my other stuff up. I started doing that, and I accumulated like 30 rentals. When these guys filed bankruptcy, well, there's one guy in town filed bankruptcy on me and 42 other people to the tune of like 16, 17 million bucks. My daughter was born the day, like two days before. And I get this letter saying, you're, we're not paying you. We, owe, we know we owe you all this money, but you're never going to get paid. And I sat there and I said, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. And my wife's like, what are you talking about? Oh my <laughs> gosh. I go, sweetheart, I'm selling our rentals. I'm going to cash out our equity. I'm going to make sure that we get all of our guys paid. I'm going to take care of everything. And I'm going to go all into real estate. Mm. I sold my franchise because by that time I'd figure out how to just do it without the, the corporation. 
And I just went full into creative finance. I said, I don't have cash. I've lost the majority of my millions. I don't have cash to accumulate rentals. I need to go and get my cash flow back. And so I went on this hell bent journey to just go, I'm acquiring every sub two and seller finance deal on the planet and I'm gonna document the heck out of it. And so I documented it and within a year, everybody's like, whoa, look at this dude just gobbling up <laughs> sub twos and seller finance deals. Yeah. And it got to a point where then I bought a title company and I started understanding the title and escrow work. And then I partnered with an attorney on certain things. And I just got to a point where I knew more than anybody else did. And just the call that when you and I took a little break before, I just get calls. People go, I got a seller finance deal. I got a seller finance deal. I could buy a million dollars of real estate every single day just from my Instagram. Right. Just from my Instagram. Right. It's crazy. It's cra And you, you could probably buy more. That's the crazy thing about, um, you know, especially where you've been in the last couple of years. But what happened is I just went full-fledged into it and I bought into everything. And now we're well over 300 doors between mobile home parks and single family homes and a lot of Airbnbs. And every single one of them was acquired with subject to and seller finance. Case Morby, what's up, man? Bro, I just can't believe we're having a slumber party over here in Miami. This is freaking cool. We are. We're, we're here for Cardone's event. Um, we were here three months ago. It was one of the best events I've ever been to in my life. Me too. And I'm not a guy who's just like hyping things up. I'm like, dude, this is, that sucked. That was good. This was super good. What did you like about that three months ago? I, I looked over at you because you and I sat on other sides of the room and I would look over at Pineda and he, he, he was like this a couple of times through the three days that we were here three months ago. <laughs> yeah. What did you like the most about that? You know, I don't even take notes on anything I do. I sit there and observe most times, but I had my journal out and I was just taking a bunch of notes and then I would kind of like think about it. And I was like, wow, I've never thought about whatever he said in that way or right. not even him, but just the other people speaking and you know, the connections we got to make. So I'm like super excited about this doing it again. Cause I don't know who's going to be here and, what we're going to go through or what we're going to learn. So I'm excited about that. But I would say um, the biggest thing that stuck out to me that I'm actually shifting in my company is just how he's building out his parent company and trying to acquire businesses and stuff. And that's the route we're going. Yeah. Building a whole ecosphere. So when one business survives or not survives, but is successful, everything else is successful. I love that. The company culture was insane. Yeah. Yeah. Like watching his team every morning, their huddle, I love that. The second thing I, I took away from it was he is a completely different person than what you'll ever see on social media. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because now you have him in a long form, you know, environment where he can go through and actually provide context to the, what he's talking about, but he's a completely different person and his team is insane. You know what I think about that too is I know you off camera, on camera, we know each other. And I think a, a reason people enjoy watching our stuff is because we're the same people right. on and off camera. Whereas like what you just said with Grant, where you're like, man, this guy's like a lunatic on camera, but then he's a completely kind of different, more chill version right. off camera. And I've heard, I had him on my podcast recently. That's and, phenomenal. Uh, thank so you. Very good. And go lot, watch that guys. If you haven't wa <laughs> freaking watched that, go watch that. It's really good. But like a lot of people were commenting and they're saying, dude, that's the most like relaxed I've seen him. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, because I mean, we're kind of just talking to each other like friends. And that's the way that he is like normally. And it's weird that sometimes he has to go over the top. But I mean, like you have a TV show, so you kind of know like what has to be done. Yeah, You have to go through the rhythms of being a little over the top and saying things you normally wouldn't say. So that it lands with the audience or it tells a story or what have you. And um, one thing that I'm excited about three months ago, we got in that room. I met, I met maybe four or five people. I made a million bucks between then and now in a new business and, uh, venture, mm -hmm. just getting involved in some other people's stuff. Being in the right rooms is powerful. Um, you brought up Tyke's board member or boardroom. Same thing. Like I was so excited to be involved in that. And then you've got Tyke's coming up. When is that? Three Tyke's weeks? Summit. Yeah, or or two months. January 9th. Yep. January 9th. So you've got some of the freaking coolest people speaking. Um, I'm excited about Cody. Yep. Cody's going to be great. New, new relationship of mine. Cody Sanchez. Cody Sanchez. I'm super excited about her. Excited about a bunch of other people you're, that you're having speak. I go to those events and I know I'm going to make money. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I'm going to Tykes 
to make money. Of course, you're going to have me speak, but I'm going there to make money. Hopefully I can become friends with some people there, whether it's in the green room or in the audience. What is the format? Are you guys doing a three-day event or what are you doing? So this event's going to be a bit different. It's going to be four days, but the first two days are like um, more small, intimate things. And then there's two big days. So, you know, on the small, intimate days on, on um, January 9th, we've got the board meeting. So everyone in the boardroom, we rented out the Tao nightclub private. It's going to be super dope. Just kind of talk about the future of real estate and how blockchain is going to affect it. Um, some cool developments and things happening behind the scenes. So like that's the whole mission with Tykes is like pioneer the future of real estate. Um, then we have a training day for my other company, uh, Content Empire, where we're going to be teaching people how to make content that day. So, needed. 100% needed. Yeah, we were just talking about that off camera. Um, and then the next day we've got kind of like our VIP day. They go to my office. They can see everything. And we've got our um, welcome party. And then the last two days are at the event. So if I buy a ticket for Tykes, I get to go to all of that? Uh, depending on what ticket you buy, you can get all of it. Yeah, if you get an MVP level ticket, you can get all of it, except the boardroom. The boardroom is only for... And that's on day one? Yeah. Okay, so I'll be there, and then I'll be there the other three days as well. Yeah. Dude, you're going to get so much content and collabs. And Bro, I just, I love I love being in the right rooms with the right people. It's, I, I told somebody the other day, I've never made money ever in my life. I've never made a dollar by myself. Yeah. And... If you understand that equation, you understand that the faster you meet higher quality people, the faster you'll make a lot more money. The one thing that I've always admired about you, and I told you this before, I was like, bro, we don't do nearly enough together. And I put that on me because I, I think, and Grant said this too about himself. He's like, I'm tired of being a lone wolf and right. like doing things myself. Like I'm ready to just embrace, you know partnerships and, and collabs and all those. And like, even for myself, I've been like, yeah, you know, I can kind of just do my own thing and stay in my own lane and my bubble and, you know, whatever. And I see you on the other side where you're like, hey, who's ready? I'm like, clapping with everybody. Yeah, I'm in. You got, a, you got a heartbeat? Like, let's go. What can we do together, you right. know? And I think it's amazing. You know, even when I asked him like, hey, Pace, you want to speak? You know, you want to join the boardroom? You're like, yeah, what, like, just tell me where to do it. You didn't even ask the dates. You didn't ask any nope. of that. Nope, nope, nope. I just want to be around quality people and um, do really fun things. Dude, when you don't know this game, right? You don't know real estate. You don't know how to make money at a high level. Remember what it was like when you had no control, you were powerless. Like even when you were in, in baseball, yeah. like the only skill that you had was baseball. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. And so you leave baseball. The only thing you can do is go, I'm going to go flip couches. Didn't know what to do. You had nothing. Had you no had skills. no other skills besides that. So you feel, I remember going back to my Instagram. My first post I ever made was 13 years ago. And I remember telling myself, I'm going to use my Instagram as a way to journal my life. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm journaling. And I remember every time I made a post, what I was thinking, how I felt, what I was going through. My first post is a post where, bro, I felt so helpless. Mm. And what was I missing? Knowing what I know now, what was I missing when I made that post? high quality relationships and skills. That's it. And now you, you delete everything I have. Delete my bank account, my m real estate, delete everything. I have the relationships and I have the skill sets that I've learned from those relationships. I have all the power in the world. Yeah. And you can I, go to I'll, zero and you'll be fine. Be fine. And it's the, most, it's the biggest confidence booster is just being around really quality people. And I, I grew up in the contractor world. Mm -hmm. And so contractors are always pitting against other contractors. It is in the definition. It's like, Homeowners go, go get three bids. So home uh, contractors are constantly knowing they're always being bid against other people. And so there's this wall, this dividing wall where mentally you, I grew up thinking everybody else is my enemy. Mm -hmm. And then when I finally learned real estate and I started seeing people like you, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I, I can actually become people's friends that are my somewhat competitors. Mm -hmm. And together we actually become stronger. Yeah, and that's the thing that I've realized about business in general, right? Because coming from the world of sports, it's very much like the world of construction where you're kind of like on your own. And if I don't play well, I'm kind of going to get cut right. or <laughs> released or I'm done. And there's nobody that can really help me. Like granted, the team can still win if I don't perform, but still they're going to be looking to get rid of me. Yeah, and then like same thing when you guys are coming up to the big leagues, right? Like there's a draft. 
Yep. It's like they're There's competing somebody, against everybody always else. always behind you trying to take your spot. Right. And you're trying to take someone else's spot. And it is what it is. There's only one starting spot at that position. Right. So it's not like we can go share the spot. It's you or me. And that's like literally how it was raised. And, you know, when I came into business, I started to realize like, man, it's different because I don't have to do it alone. In fact, if I suck at something, somebody else can be good at it. And we can do really well together. Whereas in baseball, it's like, dude, if I can't field <laughs> and I can only hit, I'm kind of limited. Right. Nobody can go field for me. Um, it, it just is what it well, is. Well, if you look at my collaboration with Jamil, which is my longest lasting collaboration, Jamil, the reason why our collab works out so well is because he has um, a skill that I don't have. Which is? It's very, it's a very weird skill. Being a genie or what? It, it, in some ways, yes, it is like being a genie. Okay. It is not real estate related at all. He has the ability to tell whether somebody's a good person or a bad person immediately. Mm. What, do, what do they call it? It's like a... Um, he's like, he's got that motherly instinct or something. Yes, I don't have that. <laughs> okay, you assume, assume everyone's good. Everybody's good. And I'm like, I'm like a puppy dog. Like, let's pet me. Let's hang out. Let's do stuff. Let, da, 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 da. And Jamil will say, stay away from that person. They see the way they're doing this. Da, 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 da. And Jamil has been the guy that has had my back for the last five or six years. And he's the polar opposite. He's yin and yang. Yeah. And so he brings things to the table that I will never in my life ever be able to acquire those skill sets. And so if, as long as I keep him as close to me as possible, he's navigated me through the jungle at like 10 times faster than I could have by myself. Mm. And the same thing on my side, when I met Jamil, guess what he had? Zero Instagram posts. <laughs> Literally his profile photo was a picture of an owl. And an so, owl? Would, yeah, so here's what I would do. <laughs> I would do Instagram stories every day, like 10 times. And I would, what year was this? This is 2017. Okay. So five, six years ago. Okay. And I was, I've always done Instagram, even when I was a contractor before I was, um, before I was ever thinking about branding myself again, I wanted to keep it as a journal. Right. Yeah. So I started tagging Jamil in all these stories and he'd be like, bro, what, do, why do you keep tagging me? <laughs> and I'm like, well, you can turn the notifications off on your phone, but I suggest you just take those Instagram posts and reshare them, reshare them and reshare them. So for the first two years, Jamil was on Instagram. It was just a reshare of all of my stories. <laughs> and then he, but he got the mechanics down. Yeah. Right. He started going, okay, I understand this. Okay. I'm going to add like a little gif. I'm going to add a little, little this. And then all of a sudden he's like, what's next? What are we doing next? Mm -hmm. So what I brought to the table for Jamil is the storytelling, the ability to market yourself and do all those types of things. And then together we've gone out and now we're dividing and conquering. So he's on, he's at one mastermind. I'm at a dis different mastermind. Learning each and then coming together. <laughs> bringing resources, relationships, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Bro, I, literally I was driving here with Cody Sperber. You just did a podcast with him just recently yeah. as well. And Sperber goes, this was the most genius thing you guys ever did was collaborating with each other and growing 10 times faster than you could have on your own. Well, and yeah, I mean, Cody's another example of a guy who's kind of been a lone wolf. Yes. Right. And then he's now seeing the benefits of getting around everyone and opening up and it's been big. Yeah. And doing big events like Tykes is one of those amazing um, pilgrimages that you kind of have to do. Like if you're trying to ha have influence, be around people with influence, learn what that even means, how that can make you money. You got to make that pilgrimage. You got to come in and like be around the people in the energy. When we were at Grant's thing three months ago, I didn't know, I knew that I was going to walk away. I mean, Timbaland was sitting two chairs behind <laughs> me. Yeah. Right. It's a different atmosphere, but I didn't know when I, when I left, I would get involved in two other people's businesses and literally have made in three months, a million bucks, non-real estate related. Mm -hmm. And it's just getting around the right people as quickly as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. I wish I knew this 10 years ago. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think it just comes down to being open to doing it, but also to being able to provide value, right? Nobody's yeah. letting you inside their business. No. You know, the guy you were five years ago. No. Right. So it's kind of like the chicken and the egg thing where it's like, how do you get good enough where people are like wanting yeah. to have you come on versus, you know, you having to go earn your stripes and. Yeah. Like a really, a really good example of that. And I, I told Jamil today, I was like, Ryan's kind of like an, a, a bigger brother that like is ahead of you 10 steps. And that as you're coming up through like, it's like you've already gone to our ninth grade English class. <laughs> and so when I'm there three years later, you're like, hey, watch out. Mrs. Greenwood's going to tell you this, this, and this. you got to watch out for these things. So it's kind of nice to follow in your footsteps. And one of those things very specifically is I've looked up to you for a long time, but also one of my heroes is um, Minority Mindset. Yeah, yeah. Jasper, yeah. 
Right. And you guys are friends mm -hmm. because you deserve those. You earned your stripes. I had not at the time. Mm -hmm. And so a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, I wanted to be his friend. I wanted to be in his world. I didn't deserve it yet. I had to go put the work in. I had to get better at storytelling. I had to get better at posting. I had to get better at consistency. I had to get better at so many other things. Right. To the point where I had a big enough audience. We got a TV show. Now I have something to offer. Yeah. But it wasn't that it wasn't in my mind three years ago. Right. It was that I knew I didn't deserve it. And instead of me being a baby about it, like, oh, nobody wants to play with me. <laughs> yeah. It's like, nobody wants to play with me for good reason. Get better at what you're doing, get around better people, and then at one point you'll deserve it. And at, at, then I sent you a text message. Actually, I did, this is what's cool. I didn't send you a text message. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I posted on Instagram stories and I go, I want to know minority mindset. And in five minutes, mm -hmm. you go, oh, Pace, I know that teacher, Mrs. Greenwood. I've been there. Here's <laughs> the da, 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 da. And you put me in touch with Yaspreet. Yeah, yep. And so you, you have to go through all these things. And then I think that toughest part of all of this really when you're building a brand and you're going this direction is knowing how do you make money from all this stuff mm -hmm. right like in your guys's content your new business that you're i'm super excited about this because i don't think anybody's i think somebody should have done this 10 years ago mm -hmm. but with your new company are you guys showing people not only how to post but also how to make money from it oh yeah yeah so the, the whole the mission statement is helping entrepreneurs build their personal brand and business on social media and the goal is to teach them not only how to get views, but turn those views into dollars. So I think, so here's the, one of the biggest takeaways I took away from Grant's thing three months ago. He says, only 1% of my audience buys a product from me. 99% mm -hmm. of people don't. And so you have to give them something to invest in other than a product. And I was like, what does that mean? And for me, it was watching him put these funds together, yeah. right? These big real estate funds. It's like, and then I, this is what I took from, I go, 99% of your audience will never buy a product from you because they don't believe in themselves. It's not that they don't believe in Ryan Pineda or Pace Morby. It's they don't believe in themselves to take action on it. Mm -hmm. But when you put a Pineda fund together, what's your guys' this fund called? Pineda Capital. So Pineda Capital. Yep. Now those 99% of people that don't necessarily trust themselves to go buy something to then have to take action. Right. They know that Pineda is going to make something happen. Yeah. And what Grant said was, the people who invest in Cardone Capital or Pineda Capital, they go home and they pray for you to be successful. Mm. I was like, oh my gosh, this is for people that don't understand why content is so important. It is the modern way to raise capital. Yeah. So if you want to go buy a hundred million dollars in real estate, you have to like this year we raised $68 million in, in private money. Mm. How do we do that? Not by cold calling people. <laughs> Like yeah. that's, that's stuff that Wolf of Wall Street did 20, 30 years ago. It's now everything has to go through Instagram, YouTube, et cetera. And I tell people too, like, if you don't have a YouTube, I don't think you're, I don't think you're credible. Cause I don't think YouTube can be hacked. No. Yeah. Instagram, like Instagram can be hacked. Yeah, yeah. I, you look at somebody with 2 million followers on Instagram, you're like, nope, YouTube. I'm like verified. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. And that's the thing too, is I, I tell people this at Content Empire. I'm like, Hey, so you know, not only is organic traffic going to be great for your business and all this stuff, but if you do start running paid traffic, it's right. going to amplify it so much because guess what? If nobody's ever heard of Pace Morby, what's the first thing they're going to do? Google. They're going to Google. They're going to look up, see if this guy's got any YouTube videos or anything. They're going to see, oh, dude, he's got 100,000 subs. He's doing these live streams. He's got like, okay, cool. I can get behind this guy. And by the time, you know, they see your ad, they're good. Yep. So... I, I just don't see a scenario in the world to come where you can get away with not making content because your competitor will and then you're toast. Like. You're irresponsible <laughs> is what you are. You're irresponsible. To me, I tell people, imagine McDonald's trying to sell a hamburger without a single golden arch on their building. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, let's say I'm driving down the freeway from Arizona, from Nevada to Arizona. Yeah. And I'm going to hang out at Pineda's studio and I'm hungry and I... What am I looking for? I'm looking for the golden arches. I know there's a hamburger I can go buy right there. Right. But if you're not branding yourself, you're not posting yourself, you're not doing anything, like how do I even know what you offer? Mm. How do I even know what you have for me to buy? I don't, I don't even, I have no clue how to spend money with you. Well, and the thing is too, this was something I took away from Grant too. He was like, hey, assume no one's ever seen your ad, Yeah. right? And you know, I'm like, I'm doing a big launch for my book coming out. Yeah. And you when? know, I'm like, uh, December 13th. Okay. So I'm like talking about it 
every day right now. And it's funny because in my mind, I'm like, everybody's seen it. And then I'm like, you know what? No, they haven't. They haven't, dude. Everyone has not seen it. I'm just going to post it nonstop. They haven't seen it. We've, we have this um, big meetup going on with DJ Envy and the Breakfast Club and on Thursday this week in New Jersey. Okay. I've been posting about it every two days. <laughs> and I'm like, it's on my stories. And I post it today. Like, oh, I'm so excited about the meetup coming up on Thursday. And people are like, what meetup? <laughs> I'm like, where have you been for 30 days? Yeah. The, the thing we forget as content creators is that we're on there every day for, I'm on Instagram probably every day for 15 to 45 minutes. Most people in your world, your audience, they're not on there every day. They well, might go there looking every, at all these other, you don't know what right. the algorithms feeding them and you know, whatever. So yeah, I, I was like, all right, I'm just going to post it. But you know, long story short, I think that you just have to get over it and just constantly, constantly be marketing because McDonald's could not just quit marketing today, even though they've established such a great brand, mm -hmm. right? And all of a sudden people, like they're not gonna lose market share. They will. Like if you don't stay top of mind, no matter how successful you've been in the long run, it doesn't matter. That's scary to think that even McDonald's, if they stop marketing, would lose market share. They they're would. the king. Everybody knows McDonald's. Yep, they would lose market share. And the people that say, oh, well, I don't, I don't see a billboard and go buy a hamburger. Yes, you do. <laughs> you just don't know you do. Right. And it's the same thing with anything, right? If you're a real estate investor and you're trying to raise capital, guess what's going to happen? Beardy Brandon, good friend of both, both of ours, Beardy Brandon's ad on Instagram is going to push that accredited investor over to his fund versus ours. Yeah, because he was top of mind. Top of mind. Yeah. And it's the same thing with just like every business in general. It's like, or I was actually thinking about this the other day. We were just watching um, the Netflix before this with Zac Efron. Yeah, yeah. And in my mind, I was thinking... Man, where has Zach Efron been? Like, you know, he's got like he this. He took weird... really peace out for like two years or yeah, something. Yeah, like his face looks totally different. Like everything about him's different. And where's he been? And the fact was, I hadn't thought about Zach Efron for two years because he just wasn't out there. And he's a mega A-list celebrity. And you see celebrities like that who all of a sudden they they re-show up in a movie. I was watching Netflix again the other day and I saw Lindsay Lohan was in a movie. And I was like, Lindsay Lohan, where has she been? But to the point, when you don't stay top of mind, it does not matter how relevant you are or how famous you are at that very moment. It will go away. It will go away. And I think the other thing that people really want to consume is they want to consume a product that they actually feel like they're a part of, right? Versus like, oh, I saw McDonald's and I saw their ad. They want to feel like they're part of your world, right? They want to know your wife, your kids, et cetera. They trust you, all those types of things. So people that are out there, I don't care who you are. You're, if you're an insurance agent, you're a, a bicycle repairman, I don't care what it is. Creating funny content or along the lines of whatever it is you're trying to sell. Yeah. Unbelievable. Same thing with video guys. Like our video guys that they used to work on side projects. Now they're full-time with us, but they talk about filming with us and all of a sudden they're overwhelmed. They're yeah. getting calls from Lenovo and... HP and like, Hey, we saw you on Pace's Instagram. Do you want to come do an HP thing? We'll pay you 12,000 bucks. He's like, dude, I, how did I get so lucky? I'm like, you didn't get lucky. You just put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. So I was thinking about this, uh, just in general with retirement and working and things like that. You know, somebody might take what I just said and said, man, well, I don't want to do that then. If I have to constantly stay top of mind, like there's no end to it. And the reality is we're kind of fed this lie that, hey, you know, you can work really hard and then, you know, get enough passive income and you can retire. And yeah. it's like, no, nah, there's not really that thing of passive income. There's yeah. always like maintenance to a degree of how much, how it, it, there's basically how passive is it? Yeah, I, I don't think it really is passive. And then yeah. here, here's the other thing I've realized. Somebody who was able to create the passive income that they desired, 10 grand, 20 grand, $30,000, that type of person that hits that number is a performer. And so what happens, they're somebody who achieves things. They get to 30,000 a month in passive income and they go, okay, what's next? Mm -hmm. I don't know anybody that just hits $30,000 and goes, okay, I don't have a new goal or I don't have a new thing to it. Yeah. God did not put you on this earth to learn how to make $30,000 passive income and then just chill. No. You, you acquired skills, confidence, relationships, resources, and all these things along the way to get to that 30,000. And yeah. now what, you're just going to hold to yourself and be selfish? Well, I've said this a lot. Um, as a Christian, nowhere in the Bible does it ever say to retire. It's not, you, you will not find it anywhere. Interesting. Like, 
you, you listen to any of the disciples, any of um, the people who are following Jesus, they all were preaching and going out there discipling until they died. Right. Like, and they're actually killed. Right? right. So like they're killed for their job of just going out there. Nobody like did enough, got to their level of like, yep, you know, I planted this many churches. I'm good. And then they just retired. It, yeah, do, it I, doesn't exist. It was a lie that was fed to me too. Like when I was 23, 24, people would tell me, once you hit $10,000 a month in passive income, you'll never want to work again. $10,000 a month? Really? It doesn't get you that far. It does not get you far at all. In fact, I, th I think 20,000 is the new 10,000, right? There were people like, I want to hit six, six I was, figures. I just had Brad Lee on and he said, we were talking about that 20,000 mark kind of being like where you can actually start really living. Yeah. But he was I agree like- with that. When I was growing up, everyone wanted to be a millionaire. And he's like, being a millionaire ain't all that anymore. No. And he's like, the 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 way that I envision a millionaire, a super rich person is like, you better be a billionaire. That's what Brad was saying. Yeah. And he's like, but in like the practical side of things, you better make at least, you better be worth at least 10 million. Like right. to really be wealthy. Right. And I, I think also going along with Christian values, right? Like, Jesus didn't just go to people and help them and say, okay, keep it to yourself. Yeah. Right. Like Jesus came to people, helped them, mended their situation, gave them a, a parable, a story, whatever the, the thing was, and then said, go tell everybody. Mm -hmm. So your job isn't to just get to a point and then chill. Your job is to get to a point where you retire, you are going to retire, but what you're going to do is you're going to retire. Let's say you hit 20,000 or 30,000 a month in passive. You will retire from the worry of how to how to pay your bills. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, it's like, now what, now the real work really begins. Mm -hmm. How do you change or actually create, um, real change in other people's lives other than just your own? Yeah. And I guess my point with it is like, even once you get to that 30,000, there is still work into oh. making sure that that still makes you 30,000. Bro. I had, so when I, this is what happened. <laughs> I get, I got to a point where our passive income was over 20,000 bucks. And then I go, wait, this isn't very passive. I need to hire like three more people to manage this $20,000 passive. Yeah, now it's 10. Now it's 10. Yeah. And so um, what I learned is I was like, okay, I need to actually get to like 100,000 to be to a point where I'm at 60, 70,000 yeah. because you have to have a team of people for it to truly be 95% passive. Mm -hmm. And even then you still have to have meetings every week. What's going on? Hey, Pace, we have an eviction that's taking four months. What do you want to do? Should we file a lawsuit? Blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. That stuff never ends. Yeah. Never yeah. end. So if people that are like, well, I just want to own real estate, guys, it's does not matter. It's always going to be happening. Real quick, if you haven't heard, my book, The Wealthy Way, is coming out December 13th. I have been working on this book for years, and I'm super excited about it, and I want to have a massive launch, and I need your help. So here's what we are going to do. You can actually pre-order the book on Amazon right now on the Kindle version. And the best part is that Kindle version is only going to be 99 cents. Now, this book is a lot more valuable than 99 cents, but I want to get it in everyone's hands. So you can support by ordering it there right now. Now, on December 13th, you can get access to the paperback. You can get access to the Audible and all that good stuff. But that's not all we're doing. If you want to really support and leave a review for the book, I'm actually going to be giving away a free course that I created called Business Builder Academy. This is teaching everyone how to start a business from start to scratch, how to figure out your branding, your products, sales, marketing, everything that I've done to start up all of my businesses, I've put into this academy and I'm gonna give it to you completely free as long as you leave a review on Amazon. So think about it, you can go buy the book for a dollar, leave a review and get a course worth thousands. So, if you want to support and you want to get access to that, go to wealthywaybook.com, okay? Wealthywaybook.com, you'll be able to go pre-order it, you'll be able to submit proof of your review, and you're gonna get access to that course. So I appreciate all you guys. Let's have a huge launch for this book and change some lives. Well, and like look at you know the market today, right? All these people that were banking on passive income mm. with stocks or crypto or even real estate, and you know, the market just goes into a frenzy everywhere, oh, yeah. right? businesses, you know, laying people off and all this stuff. And it's like, no matter what, and I, I know that you've experienced this, like for me, it's just like, dude, the more things we got going on, the more problems we have. Right? Oh, yeah. And it's just like, how are we going to solve this problem now? All right. This investment looks like crap now. This, well, that this was, business that sucks was something now. I, like, learned what are we from, doing? I learned from guys like you. I learned from other guys ahead of us. 
you actually don't, people, you go from saying, I want to get rid of all my problems to now you get to a point where I want to solve bigger problems. Mm -hmm. It's a complete different paradigm, right? Yeah. Completely different para paradigm is you are now seeking out much larger problems to get much larger checks. Yeah. For me, um, what happened to me this year is we have a little over 30 Airbnbs in um, Atlanta, Georgia. Mm. Okay. Atlanta, Georgia got why? hammered. Why, why do you have, I just have a big student base there and I buy a ton, I buy probably 60% of my deals in Atlanta from my students. Cause they're uh -huh. just so active there. Got it. A ton of sub two deals in, in Atlanta and seller finance deals. Okay. And I've got a 500 unit uh, multifamily that we're closing this month there as mm. well. My biggest deal ever, $109 million deal. Wow. That's a big, that's a big deal. So Atlanta changes their laws on Airbnbs. You can only have one property per license. <laughs> Bro, it changed my business. My, my business overnight, we had to hire a full-time person just to convert our Airbnbs into midterm right. rentals. And some of them sober living because we couldn't handle too many midterm rentals on the market all at the same time. That happens in like a week. Yeah. A week. It's crazy. So the, the whole market will change. And so people that believe nothing's going to change. I'm going to get my 20,000. I'm going to chill and like be on a beach. That does, that does not exist. No. And, and my thing back to those people is how dare you? Like I, for me, I look at those people and go, you acquired resources, relationships, skills, money, and all this stuff. And you're going to go chill on a beach. Mm -hmm. Think about the hundreds of people that could in your own church yeah. or other places that you could hire people, you could improve other people's lives. It is your responsibility to do more is yeah. my thing. No, I'm, a, I'm with you 100%. I um, Not only just the way we're wired, like you said, high performers want to accomplish the next task. What's next? Right? Um, but yeah, just thinking about that too, like what's the bigger purpose of what you're doing, right? And that's something I've had to think about a lot as you know my career has continued to evolve and I'm like, man, okay, what's the point of starting another business? What's right. the point of buying more real estate? What's the point of making another video, filming another podcast, right? Isn't that so funny that you go from like, I, w I need to start another business. I need to start, I need to buy more real estate. How do I do that? I don't have the secrets. I don't know what I'm doing to now you're at a point where you go, what's the point of it? So have yeah. you figured out the answer? Yeah. And I actually had, um, and I've kind of like been navigating the answer and, yeah. you know, Figuring really, it out along the way. Well, a lot of praying about it, but like, you know, it comes down to so many people have like five-year plans or whatever goals, right? And they'll, they'll say, I want to be a billionaire. I want to be a millionaire, whatever, right? And every time I hear that, I go, why? And, you know, they're just like, well, it's just a goal. And I'm like, that's dumb. Like, what's the the reason behind the goal? Because if, if the goal is to just make X amount of passive income or like, Really, like, what's the true meaning behind why you want to do that? Is it because you want to spend more time with your family? Okay, like that's that's good. Like, I just I want to know why twenty thousand a month is a significant number. Why is being a billionaire a significant thing? And so I've never had a goal like that, literally. And up to this point, I've never cared about what my net worth was. I've never cared for passive income. I've never cared for a certain income level, a certain amount of followers. It's just been like. We would set goals because we have to in right. a business. And well, your I'm, team needs to know them. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, like this year, let, like, let's go for that. Let's go for that. But if you were to ask me, what's the five-year goal? There is none. And I think it was kind of me just being open to everything of just like, hey, let me just see where God leads me, and that's where I'm going to go. And at this point now, it's a lot more clear. And I had um, my business coach, Gary Harper, um, come and sit down with us. He's a legend. I was just texting him a couple of days ago. Yep, like 10 days ago. Um, he's in the Tykes boardroom as well. And, you know, he came to my office for two days. He's coming back in December to double check that we're executing everything. But, you know, like one of the things was just defining like my purpose and the company's purpose overall and figuring out where are we going in five years? Like now that we know what we know, where things stand today, he's like, it's pretty obvious where you're going. He's like, I'll, I'll give you my perspective on it as somebody who's watched you for many years and I see what's, you know, motivates you and drives you. And he's like, look, you know, you're, you're just purpose driven. You don't necessarily care too much about the money, but you know, money is, you know, something that's needed to go solve the purpose. Right. right. And so for me, I'm passionate about, you know, Christian 
you know, just different ventures, whether right. it's funding churches, whether it's helping Christian entrepreneurs because they don't really have anyone else to look up to, right. whether it's, um, you know, serving other people just like you having that servant mentality. Um, I know that like for me, I need money to do all those things. And I know that I have influence to go affect the entrepreneurs right. and, you know, make a change. Cause like who else will? And, and at least that niche, Nobody. Right? there's not many people. And so it's like, if God's given me that ability, then I would be disobedient, not doing it to the point of you said, who are you to have all those skills? How dare you? Yeah. Right. And that's how I look at it. If like, if I just go chill and do nothing and don't maximize the skills and the opportunity that I have, like, how dare me? Yeah. Let's talk about that for a sec, man. First off, Crazy story, dude. I, I've heard bits and pieces of it, but to hear the full thing, you know, and just to to see the journey of, man, you know, I was the contractor and it didn't even occur to me to, you know, try and buy these things and then getting screwed over by the flippers. And then, you know, the piece that I'm curious about that you mentioned is mm -hmm. um, you started buying doors and doing stuff too. Like, where did you learn it and what made you even want to go that route? So I because homebusters wasn't teaching you. No, they did not want me to do it. <laughs> yeah, they did not want me to do it because there's no way for them to make any money on the royalty. Yeah, because homebusters, what they do is they let's say I spent twenty grand a month on marketing, they would charge thirty percent of that went into their pocket. Yeah. Okay, thirty percent for so, managing the budget. Yeah, whatever. managing the budget. So I really was only investing fourteen grand into real marketing. Then I would go, let's say, do a hundred thousand dollars in revenue through wholesale deals or fix and flips or whatever. And they would take then upwards of 15% of that. Yeah. Okay. Right. How do they make money on a sub two deal that I just acquired from a lead that there's no, tr there's no transaction there. There's no money made on day one. Right. Right. Well, yeah, how did they do that with like just even normal rentals? So they wanted to take 3% or something along the lines oh, okay. down the road and they really anchored themselves in and they had a hard time understanding how did you acquire this? Tell us how you acquired this. We don't like that you're doing this because it wasn't monetizable for them. Yeah, yeah. So they didn't like it. I was constantly getting um, criticized about it. But where I found out about it is a guy in Phoenix charged $47,000 to teach creative finance. Okay. And um, going through that whole process, on day 10, I realized this guy hadn't done a deal in 10 years. <laughs> you know, like, So you paid for it. I paid for it. But what made you like even like search for it and like, dude, I'm going to spend 47000 because I want to learn Great this. question. Nobody's ever asked me this. Thank you so much. This is great. <laughs> this is really, really good. So here's what happens in Homebusters. You spend twenty grand and you end up, it all comes down to cost per lead. Yeah. Okay. I would do cost per phone call. So I knew that when I first bought my franchise back in 2015 or so, my phone call, if I had a phone call come in, it cost me $400. Right. I'm not missing that phone call. Over the course of two years of owning that franchise, it got up to $1,100 per phone call. Oh, jeez. Right? <laughs> you ain't going to make money. Right. So think <laughs> about this. If I go, if I spend 20 grand and my cost per lead is 1100 bucks, that means I'm getting about 16 to 17 phone calls a month for $20,000. And guys, I don't, Home Investors has sent me like cease and desist for talking about this kind of stuff. Guys, send all the cease and desist you want. I can talk about this all I want. Every single home investor in the nation is struggling with this exact issue. Yeah. Their cost per lead is astronomical. So they're not adjusting. They're not adjusting. They're not cold calling. They're not texting. Yeah. They're not doing RV. They're doing none of that. Yeah. It's all direct mail, billboard, TV, and radio. It's the most archaic stuff. TV works, but you, it has to be more localized. It has to be behind a personality. Yeah. It can't be, be like, you know, home, we buy ugly houses. But you know, what's funny about that is, uh, I, you know, we've been running TV commercials for the last two years right. and, uh, they've been great. Like we've just freaking run them. I have literally the same commercial for two years straight. Right, right. I haven't changed it. And uh, I started running billboards too, in conjunction with it. And, um, we're not really running them anymore, but when I started running them, I had heard through the grapevine that home investors was pissed and I'm not even in home investors. Like right, I, right. I have home run offer. I do my own thing. Right. But, uh, they were mad because it was kind of like on their territory. Like my commercials outperform. Yep. You know, I think our cost per lead on TV commercials for me is like less than a hundred bucks. Oh my gosh. And these are great leads for do you, TV. Do you know why their leads are so expensive? It's because there's 20 people in a territory all putting their money together. Yeah. They call it an ad council. Okay? Yeah. So the 20 people all put their money together 
and they have to spend all that money. So the more money there is, it gets inefficient. It gets so inefficient. They're sending people that have no equity all of these mail, and that's why I had to I had to adapt. I go. I had sixteen phone calls for twenty grand, and like eleven of these people have no equity. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing too is like I tell this to you know people all the time is you're gonna like you can't just cold call um, just a very niche list if you want to do it in volume. You're right. just gonna end up hitting everybody because it's just. There's only so many people you can cold call. And right. the same thing applies to, to home investors. Like, dude, if you got a million dollar budget a month, you're just going to be inefficient. There's right. no other, you can't hit everybody targeted like somebody else could. And the thing is, where does home investors make their money? They make their money in having more territories, more individuals, more spend, marketing, more marketing. They take 30% of that. And so they, at the end of the day, they don't care. They want more franchisees and they want more ad spend. Yeah. That's how they make their money. For us, we're sitting there saying, "Man, I got 16 calls, and literally, I got two deals out of that." I that means that, my, that, that's actually really good, bro. And here's <laughs> the thing: is so I rem, this is this was where it really I had, had had this epiphany was, I'm on stage, I'm top three closers, not top three percent, top three closers in the company, and I'm at their big seminar, 1,100 people at this big thing. I'm getting a trophy, and I'm like. I'm top three. <laughs> You're like, I don't think I'm doing that great. Like I, I probably <laughs> took home half a million dollars, which is great. But again, that half a million dollars went into these other people's businesses that ended up filing bankruptcy on me. But what happened was I'm sitting up here on stage. I'm like, man, there's nobody in here making money. There has to be a better solution. So this is what they would tell me. They go, well, you need to go out and find referral business. And that's how that should be 50% of your business. So this is what happens. I go out and I go, okay, I'm going to go to probate attorney. So I d go develop a relationship with a gentleman named Ryan Hodges, a probate attorney in Phoenix, Arizona. And um, he goes, bro, I'd love to give you deals. Here we go. So I double my volume in like two months. And my whole ad council, 19 other guys go, what, what are you doing? But not from a standpoint of like, hey, bro, what are you doing? Kind of like you and I were yeah. having a good conversation here. It's like accusatory. Mm. And it got to a point where the ad council started coming against me. And um, I just, it was just not a good vibe. Anyway, Ryan Hodges sends me this referral. No equity. And I'm like, what the heck do I do with this deal? I want to make Ryan Hodges super proud of me that I, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? And so I started Googling and I started figuring it out. And I'm like, oh my gosh, there's this thing called subject two. And I find this guy named, I won't tell, say his name because, you know, I don't want a yeah. lawsuit from the guy. But um, I go pay him, and within 10 days, I realize he hasn't done a deal in 10 years. Doesn't, yeah. it doesn't, his contract's outdated. Everything's outdated. He didn't understand do on sell. He didn't understand all these things. And so I just went down the rabbit hole, and I figured out everything. I went to a title company that was doing it. I, shout out Eileen Brown. And a title lady had been doing creative finance deals for 40 years. She walked me through my, my first deal. Ah, so a title person taught a title, you. A title person taught me. That is so funny, dude. Yep, and she goes, she's like, "Look, I know that guy that you that charged you all that money. That guy's a, a cracker jack. Like, you should have never paid that guy money." I'm like, how would I have known? Yeah, she's like, "You should have taken five minutes to vet the guy. That's what you should have done." You know, and I was like, "Well, I was excited about trying to get the deal done." <laughs> you know, so anyway, that's the rabbit hole I went down. And so, like for me, when I started doing coaching, um, I was stressed out about do I deliver enough value, and it stems from that fear from that guy. Yeah. I have this tremendous fear. So you, a lot of people go, man, Pace, you overwork. Like, it's crazy what you do. I'm like, I'm fearful that I'm not providing enough value to my students. And it all came from that guy taking advantage of me. So um, anyway, I learned it, started going crazy. I realized now, here's what happened. My cost per contract, if I spend $20,000 on, on advertising and I get two deals out of 20 grand, what's my cost per contract? $10,000. Ten, $10, $10,000 yeah. a contract. The average wholesaler is not making ten thousand dollars on every contract. No, you and, got, and you got your business expenses. And business you're gonna expenses. Lose, you're gonna lose a lot of money. So when I started doing creative finance, I started getting to a point where I was doing six to seven contracts. Then I got up to ten contracts a month. Then I started realizing that my conversations with creative finance with my cash investors kept me in the game longer than another wholesaler was. My follow-up game was stronger because I had more options for them, that I was actually getting more cash deals because I had things to have more conversations about. Mm. And I, when I got to about 10 contracts a month, I was like, why am I here? These guys, all they do is criticize me and all my methods. I have to leave. And then a month later, that guy files bankruptcy on me, and I'm like, I'm out. Yeah. And I sold. I got out.
It's crazy, dude. It, yeah, I mean, that story could go on for two hours. <laughs> that is crazy. But it was a lot of it, again, was some of the best things. I think a lot of people that are in their 20s, if I could go back and just talk to myself, I would have said, look, find a guy like Ryan Pineda, find a guy like, you know, some of our, a lot of our friends, go find these guys and literally just follow their system. Make sure you're going to somebody that actually is actively doing deals, not right. somebody that hasn't done a deal in 10 years. Right. And I would have shaved 10 years off my learning curve. Yeah. Have you ever wanted to invest in real estate, but you didn't have the time to find deals yourself? That's where Fundrise comes in. Fundrise is a crowdfunding platform that has transacted over $5 billion in real estate and has over 150,000 active investors. While many funds, like my own, require accredited investors, Fundrise allows anyone to invest with as little as $500. If you'd like to learn more, check out Fundrise.com. Once again, that's Fundrise.com. Are you looking to find off-market real estate deals? One of the best tools my team uses is Batch Leads. With Batch Leads, you're able to pull data, manage lists, and send text messages. On top of that, you can get nationwide access to the MLS to get pictures and comps. My team has used Batch Leads to get some of our best deals, so I know it works. If you want to start today, you can get half off your first month by going to batchleads.io and using the promo code RYAN. Once again, that's batchleads.io, promo code RYAN for half off your first month. Now, back to the show. The one thing I'll say, though, is uh, kind of similar to how I got into fixing and flipping houses was, um, you know, seeing one of these TV commercials from these guys who, you know, probably weren't really doing deals. They're just, you know, on TV. Mm -hmm. And uh, it inspired me to go do research like you did. And I found bigger pockets and I found, you know, these things. And I'm like, oh, that's what hard money is. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what I need. Right. You know, and that, that was what sparked me to go. And. You know, I know this guy charged you a lot more than bigger pockets, but uh, it did spark you down this path. So. I, yeah, I have zero resentment. That's why I wouldn't say his name. I have zero resentment towards him. I it he taught me more lessons about life than he did about creative finance. Yeah, but he did push me he down. A you path. got that on the path that you needed. Right. So, moral of the story, guys. There's always, you know, just good you can pick out from any failure, any like quote unquote mistake. You know, and that, that's how I always look at it, man. Like I've lost a lot of money doing bad deals. I've mm -hmm. lost, you know, money from people screwing me over like those guys. And I always look back at it. I'm like, man, what is the lesson from all this? Always. And that just occurred to me from there. As you were saying, I'm like, man, well, in the end, right? Like it was like kind of the origin story of what led you down this crazy path and to now just doing all these deals and having a TV show. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a crazy story in and of itself, but like, before I go there, the last thing I'll say to people is that I didn't know my worth, Ryan. That's my problem. I didn't know my worth. I had people that saw, you know how hard I work. You think yeah. probably in, internally you're like, this guy's a little bit crazy. He's, he's, a, he's a nut. He's a nut. Um, but what would happen is people would see that energy source and they would put their thumbs on me. Mm. And what they would do is they'd go, oh, you can't do this or you don't want to fix and flip. We don't really make that much money. And people would say things to me to block me into being their resource for uh. getting deals done. And that went on for years. Dang. And even when I was with Open Door, like, oh, we, we don't make any money. You don't want to do this. We don't make any money. <laughs> well, they're, they're kind of not lying. They, right. They're they really not lying. But, <laughs> you know, they're, they can raise billions and billions of dollars. So <laughs> right. um, I'm glad I went through it. I wouldn't change it for the world. I wish I knew my worth. Um, I was brought up in a blue collar family to not be braggadocious, to not be that guy. Right. And so I just kind of kept to myself and listened to my elders and people who had more experience to me. I just listened to them. But the reality is I was listening to people that had their best interest at heart, not mine. Yeah. And I'll tell you, man, that's the hard thing to do in the world today, even at you know our current level, right? Because you, now that you've got a following, you've got all this stuff going on, you know, you get new people into your life and you're like, man, like, what's this guy's agenda? Bro. You know, can I trust this person? And so it never changes, right? Mm. Whether you're broke and you're like, man, should I invest in this coaching program? Or whether you're, you know, already established and this guy's like, yo, I got this business opportunity. It looks really good. Yeah. Do you want to partner up on it? Right. And you have to, for me, man, one of the biggest skills is just practicing discernment on you know, what path to take. We were talking about this uh, pre-show of just, man, there's a lot of different paths to take here the next five years that, you know, they're, you know, at the end of the day, right, when you're a talented guy and you're a hard worker, you're going to find a way to, like, win no matter what. Right. It doesn't matter, freaking, you choose the wrong path, you'll just go on the next path and it's right. cool. But for most people, man, it's uh, it's a tough thing to figure out. And 
it causes people, I think that causes people the most stress, like indecision because of multiple choices. Yeah, I tell people the hardest part of being in real estate is there's too many options. There's a lot. It's there's two. The, the reality is there's m way more ways to succeed than you could even like everybody that comes on your show has a different strategy. Yeah. Right. You've had Lauren Hardy. You've had Zasha come on. You've had so many different people come on here. Everybody has a different strategy. Yep. And so when you're brand new, you're looking at all these ways. Which way do I go? Mm -hmm. That's one of the m most challenging part of, about getting started. Yeah. No, 100 percent. And the thing I'll say is for anyone listening who's struggling with that is all of those ways make money. Yes. You can make money flipping. You can make money wholesaling. You can make money with creative finance. Uh, my buddy Tim Bratz was on. He's got 5,000 units. Like, Crazy. you can make money. Like, real estate, at the end of the day, is so fun because of all the ways. You know, one thing that I'm doing now is development. Like, we're building my house. We're looking at building an office Is space. that a house or is that more like a mall? <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll, we'll call it <laughs> It's something. We'll see. But uh, it's just... I enjoy, for me, I enjoy all aspects of real estate. I've, I've tried all the different ways and, you know, fixing and flipping got me to where I'm at today, but it doesn't mean that that's going to be my future. No. Right? So pre-show, I, what I loved about it is you were talking about how for you, fixing and flipping is a tool. Yeah. It's not the end all be all. It's a tool for you to ultimately get the other things that you want in life. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about real estate as well is that as you get any sort of success, the oppor other opportunities come from everywhere. Yep. But fixing and flipping and wholesale are the foundation. Like it's easy to get into, low barrier of entry, very low risk of any sort of loss. And when you find somebody that actually has a path and is currently doing it, it's like just grab a hold of that person and follow them down that road. Um it makes it a lot easier. But once you're in real estate and you do a couple of deals, you like your eyes open, you go, "Oh my gosh, this is like an endless war. It's like a video game. I could do anything." Yeah. Well, I think if you look at the most successful investors, they're all kind of specializing mm -hmm. in one thing before they branch out. Right. You know? So for you, it was sub two, seller finance. And now, you know, you're still mainly doing that, yep. but you can do whatever you want at this Everybody point. calls me, every DM I get on Instagram, every email I get is, hey, I've got a house with no equity. Hey, I've got a seller that wants too much money. That's literally every message I get. And that's your lead source to get It's my deals. lead source, yeah. yeah. I could turn off all of our direct-to-seller. I could turn off everything that we're doing in our regular business. Yeah. And I could just buy a million dollars a day of real, real estate through creative finance every day. Yep. And just from all the content you put out about it. And, you know, something we talked about, too, was like, man, you know, with, with lead sources and um, social media and everything, like one of the big things I teach our students is like, hey, get on social media, make content. It's going to be great for getting deals. It's going to be great for raising money. It's going to be great for finding employees, for finding everything. Like you should make content. It's very important. Um, but like to see that you're getting so many deals from your content because it's a very niche thing, it's just, it's inspiring because man, one of the hardest things to get is deals, number one. Mm -hmm. And like you mentioned, when you're doing direct to seller, it can get costly if you're not, you know, very, um, I guess, precise in what you're doing. Right. And so to get just a free deal handed to you, well, it's not even a deal yet, but a lead. Right. And to have the skills to close that lead are very important. Yeah. So went back to Homevestor days, and we'll, we'll jump into the TV show and stuff too, but Going back to home investors, there's 19 other people in the ad council, right? Right. So what was happening with them? Their cost per lead was $1,100 every phone call as well. Yeah. So what would happen is I'd go, hey, guys, I know how to handle those leads. So I realized five, six years ago that I could handle people's dead leads. And I start in local Arizona market, everybody started calling it the PACE method. They go, oh, just do the PACE method. Just learn how to do creative finance and raise people's leads from the dead. Mm. And I was like, oh my gosh, I feel like I have something here. And there was a moment when I sold my franchise and I'm like, I'm going full time. There was a moment before I met my current partner, Cody Barton, there was a moment where I go, I'm just doing nothing but creative finance. Yeah. And I'm going to do nothing but Instagram, nothing but Facebook and just help other people revive their old dead leads. And I'm going to do, I'm going to crush. Yep. And then I meet my partner, Cody, and I go, okay, let's, I still want to keep flipping. I still want to do all that <laughs> stuff. And you know, so it was good that I found him, but well, it just goes back down to knowing your skill set, right? Like right. you had this unique skill set that you could do for yourself and other people. And you said, I'm going to focus on that. But it wasn't until Cody came in where you said, well, now we have two skill sets, right? You know, this guy knows how to do X, Y, Z. Why would I limit, you know, him? He can right. do this. And I've seen those same things play out for me too. It's like, man, I am good at, you know, a few things 
and it's allowed me to get to where I'm at. But I'm, you know, really bad at a lot of things. Also. Yeah, that's why you have your. <laughs> that's why you have your sister. That's yep. why you have Sean Bob. That's why you have this amazing. You have amazing people on your team. I'm very lucky, bro. You're not lucky. <laughs> There's something you have a talent for for recruiting people. I don't know what. It, maybe it's social media. I don't know. Well, I think once again, it goes back to knowing your skill set. Is um, I'm pretty good at hiring people. And You're if, phenomenal <laughs> at it. Phenomenal. I, you know, don't don't let Sean Bob and those guys hear it, dude. Because they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna be like, dude, I need a raise, man. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, I think one of my superpowers is hiring and delegating. And uh, if I, if I can just stick to doing that, creating opportunities for other people right. and empowering them and training them, dude, then why why do anything else? Yeah, I mean, you're a pure visionary. You know, you're a big, big visionary. I mean, it doesn't mean you can't get things done and you're not organized, but you are a very high level visionary. For anybody who hasn't read the book Rocket Fuel, go read that book. It's phenomenal. You're a visionary and you have other people do the integration and you have scaled to unbelievable levels. It's so fun to watch. Appreciate that, dude. Yeah, I'll say uh, for anybody who's looking to get started, Rocket Fuel is a great book. It is the um, sequel to Traction. Mm -hmm. So make sure you guys read Traction and Rocket Fuel together. Um, yeah, you know, the other thing I'll say too is with building businesses and finding your skill set, you may not know it right away. Mm -hmm. For me, I did not know I was an entrepreneur or this leader or this guy who knew how to hire people. Like, dude, I mean. Bro, you had to become a realtor to yeah. then become a couch flipper. <laughs> That's true. To then figure out how to do it. Yeah, and like you hire your first person, by no means do you think you're an expert. Right. And you do it again, you do it again. You're like, okay, I kind of got the hang of this. Mm -hmm. And then you do it for another company. And then another, and you're like, oh, it's kind of the same skill over and over again. And for people who are like, oh, well, I'm not good at hiring. I'm not good at content. I'm not good at uh, closing and negotiating. It's just like, dude, you have to just keep doing it over and over. Guys, it's repetition. Go so Instagram <laughs> comes out. Okay, now this will actually lead into the TV show. Instagram comes out. I don't remember what year, but I was sleeping on Instagram, and everybody was posting on Instagram. It was like the cool thing, kind of like TikTok is yeah. now. And I'm sleeping on it. And then my wife and I go to New York for her 25th birthday. I go, you know what? I'm going to try this stupid app out. <laughs> and if you go back, I've never deleted any post I've ever made. If you go all the way back to my first Instagram post, it has four likes to this day. <laughs> and one of those likes is me. Okay. So I three real likes. And you go back there and you look at all my contents, like taking pictures of a cheesecake, doing this, doing all sorts of stuff. But I just got the handle of what the buttons do. And I just work through it. Yep. And I had fun with it. And I didn't think, I didn't, I think at first there's a little bit of imposter syndrome when you start doing your first couple of deals. Yep. So for anybody that has imposter syndrome and you're like, well, I'm not Ryan Pineda. Well, first off, nobody's freaking Ryan Pineda, okay? <laughs> but uh, first off, you're never going to be anybody other than yourself. So what I tell people is do the good, the bad, and the ugly model where stop worrying about the, all the good stuff. Talk about, hey, this is something bad that happened that I learned from. Or, man, this was a really ugly situation that happened to me, and this is what I learned from it. Stop thinking you everything on social media has to be good, 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 good. This happened. I failed. I didn't hit my cold calls for the day. Just want to throw that out there, guys. For anybody that's struggling, I struggled too. You can have those conversations on social media. Just work through the motions because social media, recruiting, raising capital, finding deals, like you said, getting a TV show, which is ultimately how we got a freaking TV show on A&E yep. from social media. Yep. Insane. It's crazy, dude. The possibilities are endless with social media, man. Like, I tell people this all the time. Like, you just, once you put yourself out there, you never know who it's going to bring into your mm -hmm. life and, like, how it's going to impact you. It's endless too. Like that's the that's the tough thing. So I go. Um, this is 2019. I go to an event, really high level guy in our space, and he is criticizing me because Jamil and I are running around the country, like doing pop up events and not charging anybody for it, just doing pop ups, right? Yep. Just like what we did two yep. years ago. You had one um, here in Vegas. Yeah, it was a blast, and yep. we just had fun. I talked about creative finance. Jamil talked about what he was doing, and you were gracious enough to get you know 100 people there. It was a blast. And we got a lot of people like, you're not selling anything? We're like, we don't have anything to sell. So somebody, this guy at this event goes, man, everything you're doing is non-scalable. It's non-scalable, non-scalable. I had no idea what that meant. And now I know what it means. It wasn't until I really understood that social media lives forever. It's like building clones of yourself to spread a message for you eternally. Right. I was sitting there saying, I'm going to go build a following and meet people, which we still do. Right. But you have to accompany it with social media. So what happens and how we got the TV show is Jamil and I are traveling around the country. It was shortly after 
Um, we went to your event a couple of years ago and I decided I'm going to go do my first, like one of my first YouTube videos. Jamil goes, dude, I don't have the energy for anything you're doing. You're crazy. Like we just got off the road for of 30 days. I want to go home and relax. I go, come on, man, let's go do a YouTube video. <laughs> so I had a fix and flip that Jamil and I were both competing. There was a wholesaler in town sending the deal to both of us. Right. And we were bidding each other up unknowingly. We had no idea we were bidding each other up. And I go, bro, somebody's bidding me up on this deal. Is this thing worth this? What's going on? He goes, that's you? <laughs> You're the one bidding me up? And so we end up doing the deal. I go, hey, I'll buy the deal. I'll run the construction and we'll just split the profits. Let's just stop bidding each other up. So we go do a YouTube video at the house. And I go on Instagram stories. I go, who wants to come to this house? Come see Jamil and I walk through this property for the first time. It's a hoarder house. So I bring my videographer who I just had like paid part-time and he comes to the house, Jamil and myself and 20 people I've never met before show up to this house and we do a walkthrough. We make a four minute YouTube video and freaking A&E finds that. Just that random YouTube video. Random YouTube video. With not even like any subscribers. Nothing. nothing. I probably had 200 subscribers. Yeah. 200. It's crazy. But here's what they liked. They go, the fact that you were willing to bring random people to your house and show them what you, you were doing and you didn't charge them to be there and you were collaborating with somebody who was your competition, that's something different. Mm. And I was like, wow. And that courtship went on for several months and we then sat down and go, do we really want to do a TV show? Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, good conversations you and I had earlier is like, TV is not the most popular medium nowadays, right? Like how many people actually have cable that you and I hang out with? Right. Almost nobody. Right. But is that the most popular medium? No. However, I kind of wanted to check the box of saying, in 20 years, I want to be able to say, we had a TV show at one point. And that right. was really, really cool. Your kids will be like, what's that? Right, exactly. <laughs> but my kid, that's a cool thing too, is we ended up incorporating my wife. My kids are on the show. I spend yeah. so I get to spend six to eight hours a day with my wife and kids on the TV show. And we got incredibly blessed all through social media. Right. All through social media. Yeah. It'll be your grandkids who are asking. Yeah. They're like, what the heck? What were you guys on? Exactly. We're, we're only into the metaverse. What's I know <laughs> exactly. So my wife ends up, do we do a gender reveal? That's the craziest thing too. It's like my wife gets pregnant during the show. Do we do a gender reveal on the show? Season two, she's giving birth. Mm. And it's like, wow, okay, we're now showing people our lives. And during this, what's interesting is we're now attracting people that are also like, hey, we really want, I want a family. I want kids. I want to have a happy marriage. And it's a blessing because it's now attracting the exact kind of people I want to hang out with. Exactly. And um, we're having a lot of fun with it. It's a, it's, a, it's a blast. And two weeks ago, we get an announcement. They go, your TV show is currently not only trending on Hulu, but you guys are the number one TV show on A&E. Wow. Huge. That's crazy. We immediately get signed for season two, season three. We're talking spinoff already. Like, it's crazy. That's crazy. Crazy dude. stuff. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, so humans get incredibly entitled fast, right? Mm -hmm. So here's what happens. Like people, it, it happens in the employee world where you'll hire, hire an employee and they'll go, I'll work for you for free. Well, first off, nobody's working for me for free. You're getting paid, but that's the mentality. Then you work for me. And in two months, you're not doing, you haven't done deals or you haven't done whatever you show up late or whatever it is. It's like, you were the guy that was begging me for an opportunity. Now you're the guy that's taking other people's lunches out of the fridge in the cafeteria. Other people's opportunities. And you're, and you're showing up late, right? Same thing goes for you and I. When we, maybe it was when you were couch flipping yeah. and it was the only skill set you had besides baseball. Yep. Maybe for me, it was when I was a contractor, literally praying, praying and saying, please help me find an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Please help me find somebody that's going to help me. And then what happens, you get sucked into that world and the busyness of the world blinds you to the fact that you used to pray for the exact situation you're sitting in right now. Mm -hmm. And now you've made it and you're like, what's the purpose? Well, obviously the purpose is to go find another 1000 Ryans yeah. that need everything that you have, but take that learning curve from 10 years down to a year or mm. two years. Exactly. Right. And do that for people that have like-minded values, family oriented, mm -hmm. Christian values, that type of stuff. It sounds like that's your purpose. Yeah, it is. And it's not like I won't help non-Christians or anything. Right, but there's right? something that ignites your fire. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, and I, and I think too, it's like, and I was just thinking about this for a long time of like, man, do I want to be, you know, just like this Christian influencer and like go down that route? 
or do I just want to continue to be an entrepreneur who right. happens to be Christian, right? And that that is the route that I've chosen, but it may not be the route five years from now. Like, right. I don't know, right? You have to let it evolve. Yeah, it, it will evolve however it evolves. Um, but, you know, that's part of the story, right? Because you and I, you starting out as a contractor, me starting out as a baseball player and then a couch flipper, you know, we both become these real estate guys. And then you go into this vertical of sub two and seller finance. I kind of stay in this vertical of house flipping and social media. And then, you know, now you're coming over to that side of social media and TV. And then now I'm coming into the entrepreneur side and like, you know, embracing that aspect of it. It's just like, it's just going to keep evolving. Like right. I, it's it's super hard to say where we'll be five years from now, but I think that the purpose of what drives us, you know, if I have to become a whatever guy to serve the bigger purpose of what I want to do, then I'll do it. Like I never wanted to be a social media guy. Like I wasn't on Instagram ten years ago. Like I just I did it because I was like, this Yo, is wait, what this I is have the to keys. Do. This I is the to keys to it. make this work. Yeah, for me. Um, I, somebody asked me the other day, why are you posting so much? And I go, I'm posting so much so I can get so loud that the 10 year ago version of me can hear me. <laughs> like I'm trying to yell so loud at my, ver- my earlier version of myself, like, bro, shake out of it. There's better ways to make money. There's better relationships to have. I was in bad relationships. You know, I'm not, I've never drank, I've never smoked. I'm not a partying guy. That's not what I mean by bad relationships or bad um, environments. I was around people that didn't have the same values as me. And as a contractor, I was taught chase the money, chase the bigger job, chase, 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 chase. And I would get, I was in bad relationship with people that are running schemes and they ended up filing bankruptcy. I lost a bunch of money. And I'm like, man, I just spent eight years of my life chasing money, not acquiring skills and building relationships. But to your point, what's interesting, and this has happened for me too, is when you actually start doing something that you're passionate about and your purpose a lot of times the money just flows naturally it bro it's and so like it sounds cliche when you hear it when you don't have you don't know that that is actually the fruits of the labor Mm -hmm. and you've never seen that happen well i've asked you this before too i'm like pace how the heck do you we were talking about this i forget what event we were at oh we were at growth video live remember and we were sitting in the back and i was like pace how many hours do you spend like on Facebook lives and stuff. And you said something crazy to me. It was like 20, 30 hours a week or something. Yeah, I spend 20 to 30 hours a week on Zoom with my students. Yeah, and I was like, how do you spend 20 to 30 hours a week? On top of the TV show, Yeah, on top of all the businesses we own. But like the point was, you didn't, you don't do that because you think it's going to make you more money. Like you do it because you genuinely love doing it yeah. and you want to help them and you literally want to do everything humanly possible for them to win. Yeah. It keeps me, um, it keeps me involved in their lives. I know the majority of my students' names, their spouses' names, their kids' yeah. names, because I, I just want to, I don't know why. Yeah. And it keeps me from making money. If you really think about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You could probably make more money if you, I would make way more money. There's like calls I miss. I look at the, I look at my phone when I'm out of a six hour zoom with my students. I'm like, I miss Brad Lee's call. He wants to do a thing. I miss this. I miss this. I miss this. I'm like, okay, well, I'll call them back. And then I never get to call them back because then the next morning I'm doing a Zoom at 5 a.m. Yeah. Like I did a, I did a Zoom this morning at 5 a.m. before I flew out here. Mm. I was like, oh, Sunday morning? Let me get to, with all my students and do a four-hour Zoom before I'm supposed to fly out to Miami and hang out with Grant. Yeah. And But to the point, you do it because of your purpose and right. you love doing it, right? right? If you didn't love doing it, you wouldn't do it. No, and nobody it forces would show you to do it. Up. It would show up as me not wanting to, it would, it would show up as disingenuous. And then more importantly, like you said, I would literally just not do it. Well, and but even if you were to go to everyone and say, hey guys, you know, I'm just kind of like at this new point in my life, I'm going to be spending less time, but still a lot. Yeah. Like people would still be like, I get it. Like, yeah, go down from 30 hours to 10. Yeah, you like it's okay. Be fine. Yeah, you know, nobody's going to be mad at you <laughs> yeah. for, you know, wanting to do that. But th- the point is, if you just love what you do, you will do it. And it's like, for me, these guys will tell you, I've never missed a week of filming because I'm just like, yo, these are the videos that got to go out. Right. Um, it's not that I, I know I'm going to make all this money when I make the video. I'm just like, these have to go out for the purpose of what we're doing. Yeah. You know, so it's interesting, man. Once, once you're like more clearly defined on your purpose, 
it makes things easier. Well, I hope like at the, in the Tykes boardroom, I hope in that meeting, that's January 9th. Yep. So January 9th, I hope that I can impart some wisdom to people that are maybe not as far along in their journey as I am. Yeah. And it'll be interesting to see what everybody else is trying to do because that is a room full of people trying to do kind of the same thing, right? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of different, um, I guess, Vertical. niches of, yeah. and verticals of real estate, who's doing what. There's a lot of land guys. Obviously, you're in the creative finance space. There's developers, there's everything. Um, so I think like everyone in there is just looking for opportunity, just like you of like, hey, what can we do? Like one right. of my things with that is um, we got the Tyke Tank, which is like Shark Tank. People can pitch businesses and other things. When's that? that? Um, we're going to launch it here soon. That's so, sick. Yeah. You're going to do that on your YouTube channel? I might need to. I was going to do it behind the scenes because I'm just like, let's make the money together in the boardroom. Bro, that needs to be its own freaking YouTube channel. That yeah. sounds amazing. Yeah. Well, we're going to do it. So if somebody like January 9th, you've got the boardroom and then you've got three days of the event. Yeah. And that's going to be in Vegas. Yep. Um, who is the ideal person for going to that event? I mean, I'll say anyone who's watching this right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's anyone in real estate, any investor, entrepreneur, um, web three people. So, you know, like really the focus of the event is if, if future flipper and sub two are about, Hey, like how do we get deals today in this current market? And how right. do we, you know, do that? Tykes is about, Hey, where are things going to be five, 10 years from now? Yeah. How do we start? You know, we don't have to go fully focus on building the next, uh, you know, exchange or right. whatever's going on, fractionalizing real estate. Like it doesn't need to happen right this moment because this moment isn't ready for it. But how do you start to become aware of it and build and, you know, start acquiring the businesses that are. And be on the cutting edge. Yeah. And Rather than saying, how did I miss to this? It, yeah. You know, because if we all knew that, you know, YouTube, if, if we were thinking about this five years ago, right? Or we were thinking about Bitcoin seven, eight years ago. Right. Like, but there were people that were, and they were, were in meetings. And that's what this is. Right. Because real estate is going to change dramatically in the next five to 10 years, and nobody's preparing for it. Right. Except I us. Love it. Except <laughs> us. I, I love it. And if we, can, if we can get the business that's going to be the leading industry, right? If right. we have the business that replaces the title companies, or you know, you've got uh, that's a big thing for me. So we own title companies, and I know that that technology has to change. Has to. It has to. It is so antiquated and horrible, especially in the creative finance realm. Like, oh yeah. There's so many amazing things that I can do in creative finance just because paperwork. I can be so creative with it. Um, I mean, uh, we were t talking about how my son and the the cars and all that kind of stuff are on, off air. That I feel like that's the number one thing that has to change in real estate. You see Open Door and OfferPad and all these companies coming in and going, we want to remove the agent yeah. from the equation. I'm like, I think the thing that's going to be completely disrupted is the way deeds are transferred, the way paperwork is transferred, the way title and escrow services and title insurance and all that kind of stuff is going to completely be disrupted. That's, that's for sure the first domino. Uh -huh. and it's, it's paperwork. It's doable. Like Web3 and all this, all this stuff, NFTs, all this stuff will 100% disrupt that entire industry. So you look at Fidelity Title... What's the conversation that Fidelity is having behind the scenes? Well, but like even just think about the real estate process as a whole. Like, why does it take 30 days to get a loan? Or Jamil <laughs> just got a loan on his beach house, took six months. Why? Why? <laughs> so, let, yeah, if you're a lender, it's like, how do you speed up that process? And do you think it's because of the new technology? I think it's, a lot of it is paperwork. Yeah. I think like most of what takes a loan so long is this guy's underwriting this and that and this. It's like, dude... If you have financials ready to go, you get the financials in the system, you get an appraisal, what else is needed, right? How does it take 30 days? Well, because so I, I was a licensed loan officer for a while. And I remember it would sit on an underwriter's desk for three, four days before anybody even looked at it. Right. And it would sit there because they got a stack of whatever. So technology is going gonna, is gonna to disrupt that whole industry. And then the underwriter would come back and go, we're missing this. Mm -hmm. And it would go back and then just start the whole process all over. And you're like, the, the consumer's like, man, my lender took forever. It's like, well, you forgot something. You forgot something or you omitted something or you didn't know how to fill it out instead of picking up the phone. So there, it's on both sides, but the technology will completely disrupt and remove all of that stuff. Yeah, and AI people will be able to that, just 
Bro, there's billions to be made in that. Yeah. So that's billions. the point of Tykes is that I, we both know that because we're in the industry and we see the inefficiency. Yeah. And it's just like, whoever solves it wins. And that's how I look at it. I'm like, the tech isn't there yet. But if I'm looking at ways to become a billionaire, right? You can definitely get there owning real estate and like it will be a slow grind. Like nobody became a billionaire overnight owning real estate. No. Like it's, you'll get there, right? Yeah. I know tech billionaires overnight. Yeah. <laughs> I know people who have, you know, like what all these guys, like what Cardone's talking about doing with rolling up all these companies into one company, like that can get you a billion really quick. Right. Um, so that's the way my mind has transitioned instead of like solely focusing on real estate deals. Like we're always going to do real estate deals. I love real estate. Yeah. But I'm thinking, how do I go and get these companies? Because I love tech and companies. Right. I think you look at real estate in our in my world, it's the foundation of everything that we have. And you're right. I think that for us, we acquired uh, this year 225 million total real estate this year. And obviously there's a lot of debt on that. Yeah. But that debt pays off over a certain amount of time. It appreciates. We've got cash flow, blah, blah, yeah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. All that stuff. For sure, there's no doubt in my mind I'll be a billionaire before I die. Yeah. But how, and why is being a bill, going back to what you said, why, 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 why? My goal was, and still is, my big goal is, how do I turn a hundred of my top people, not, sorry, not a hundred, how do I take 15, maybe 20 of my top people that are with me from today going forward, how do I take them and make them all worth 20, 30, 40 million dollars in the next 10 years? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I got to do a lot more work. I got to do a lot more stuff. I got to get involved in stuff that are fa is faster than real estate because real estate pays a lot of bills today, makes me a lot of money. But how can I make other people worth 10 million, 20 million dollars? It's got to be with technology that's going to disrupt a title company. Yeah. And that that's kind of like what I've been thinking about with um now re like building out my parent company to house everything and yeah. acquire the companies. Like, well, at that point you can now start giving people stock. Yes. And they got something to look forward to. And if the company itself becomes worth a lot of money and you've got this stock from the ground up, it's a lot of money to be made. Yeah, that's what we're doing right now. We're vet, we're telling people that you'll get ownership in all of our multifamily deals. Um, they're only the exact level, but if you're with the company X amount of years, the 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 ownership vests and da 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 yeah. da. And I clocked it all out, and I go, I was so I was m way more excited about other people becoming worth ten million dollars than me becoming a billionaire. Mm -hmm. That was way more fun to me. Mm -hmm. It's like I got the money. I don't, you know, I, I don't need anything. I I want more stuff. I'd love, to have, I'd love to have every Patek on the planet. I'd love to have uh, five yachts and seven airplanes. I'd love to have all that stuff. But what I have is the same thing you have. Loving wife, amazing kids. Mm -hmm. I have my health. It's like, okay, now what more can I do? And how can I amplify my reach in helping other people? Yeah. So I get way more excited saying, I'm going to turn that person into a multi-multi-millionaire because they're helping me build my business. Yeah. No, I love it. So speaking of wife and kids and balance, and yeah. I don't know how you do it. Because I, I watch you and I'm like, this guy's an, a lunatic. He's waking up at 2.30. He's on set filming his TV show for like 50 hours a week. He's on Zoom calls another 30 hours. I'm like, does this guy have like 48 hours in a day? Like, what is he doing? I feel like I do. I feel like I get a lot of stuff done. But I, people ask me all the time, why do you work so hard? And I, going back to the Instagram post, I remember what I felt like when I had nothing to offer. Yeah. And I remember what I looked like, what it felt like when I was self, I, I was like, so my self-esteem was so low because I'm sitting there. I know how to work, but the only skills I have are construction related. Mm -hmm. So like, what do I really have to offer that other people can't offer? Now I have a lot that I can offer that other people don't. So I'm like, I just want to go. I want, I'm, now I'm nearing 40 and I'm like, bro, I just got to make everything worth it. Every single day worth it. So I do wake up very early, but the main reason I do that is because I don't want to be bothered from three o'clock to six o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. I want to read my books. I want to empty my inbox. I want to go through. I, I watch your videos. I watch Jerry Norton's videos. So that's when you start watching videos in the morning? Yeah, I'm answering emails on one screen and listening to you and other people on the other. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So I'm do, I'm doubling, I'm tripling, I'm quadrupling my efforts every single minute of my day. And then um, I think that I'm I'm talented in the sense that I can remember things. Like I'm not a note taker. Right. I just remember things. Yeah. So I, God bless me with some amazing stuff there. And then I have an amazing team. I, I train my people. I go, your job is to tell me every day that I shouldn't be involved in anything in the business. 
Mm -hmm. And if you have to ask me a question, then step one of your job is pay, never go to pace for anything. Yeah. So if you have to come to me, that means we haven't put systems and processes in place. So sometimes I forget that I own businesses. It's weird. <laughs> it's, it's really weird. I haven't been to my office. My, so we have an office on in Mason, then I have an office in Phoenix. We have hundreds of employees between the two. And um, I haven't been to both of them, except for one of them, we have an event space. So we do an events. Jamil and I do an event there every month. I haven't been inside the actual office since last year's Christmas party. <laughs> Literally. I don't go in. I'm not dealing with any of that stuff. It's just go and raise capital, go do deals. And I literally just get to go do all the fun things that I want to do. So it sounds to me like your main, like, I guess, work related things are mm -hmm. um, go do deals, find, find new opportunities, find new businesses, pass them on to an operator. Okay. So deals, right? But there's real estate yeah. business, whatever. Look for new deals. Yep. Um, Zoom calls with the students. Yep. That's where I find my peace. Yeah. Everything else is work. Okay. And then that's really it. Like it's just, and then content. Content, content would be yeah. the work, right? Content, so those yeah. three things probably take up the majority of your work. Yeah, I'm at a point now where the only time I'm involved in a real estate deal is when it's like a high level problem. Like seller needs to seller finance this 50 unit multifamily deal and we don't have to structure the taxes. So I come in and I get involved. Right. Um, that's once a month, maybe for an hour. But guess what I'm doing? I'm filming it. Yeah. It's I don't content. do anything unless there's a camera on me. Right. If somebody calls me, I have people call me all the time uh, and it stresses me out when they go, I need help right now. And I don't have a camera guy by me. I go, I can't help you. And they, <laughs> they go, what do you mean? You I can't need to double me? down. I have to, I have to use my efforts. The law of duality is what I call it. If I'm not doing two things at the same time, like right now we're doing five things at the same time. You and I are building rapport with each other, you know, deepening our relationship. We're creating content, helping other people. Um, also, I hope to promote talk, Tyke's event because I want to see you guys there. If you guys are at the Tyke's event, come talk to me. That's what I freaking love too. I love going to events and I'm never the guy in the green room. I'm always the guy in the hallway mm -hmm. and I freaking meet everybody. I, I love that. Anyway, but the law of duality, I don't do anything unless I'm doing two things at the same time. Yeah. And so it looks like I have a lot more going on. I will never make a call to my attorney without it being recorded. I will <laughs> never talk to Molly on my team, my, my business manager, unless it's being recorded. Literally, I have a, we have, I just hired a full-time guy named Jose. Jose's job is to film me eight hours a day. Mm. How does that go with filming the TV show? Do you film you filming the TV show? We try. <laughs> um, I got a call. So we, we had Grant and Elaine on the TV show a couple of months ago and they were on set and my camera guy was like getting B-roll of us on set. And then it found its way on my YouTube channel. Uh -huh. And season two hasn't premiered yet. Season two premiere is this Saturday. And, um, a and E calls me up and they're like, take that YouTube channel or video down right now, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> they were nice about it, but they were freaking pissed off because what it did is it showed Grant doing something called wild lines. Okay. So a wild line is like where Grant says something when the camera's rolling, but it doesn't mesh properly in the timing of like, so maybe somebody stepped on his line or something happened. So what they do is they go, okay, we'll find a shot where it just is the back of his head and we'll throw audio on top of him. And we call it a wild line. So it, it basically creates the illusion that he said the right thing. Right. Okay. And so they tell him the wild lines to read. They give him a, a uh, list. Okay. And so my, my guy was B rolling this whole thing and Grant's sitting here reading the lines and saying it. It's into, just like the fake TV stuff. It's like <laughs> all the fake TV stuff. And my team freaking puts it on the YouTube channel and A&E watches everything I do. Yeah. And they freak. It was two minutes on the YouTube channel. I get a call. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, so now Jose is not, when I'm filming, Jose is not over there. Eric's not over there. And so they know like they'll follow me to set and they'll do B roll of me walking onto set. But outside of that, they're not allowed on set. Got it. I've, I've violated that rule too many times. They're like, dude, no duality over here. The, you, no duality. you focus on the TV show. And, but what's funny is like when they're ready, like this week we have the premiere. Now they're like, talk about it. Talk about the show. Talk about the show. Talk about the show. I'm like, guys, I could have been talking about it for six months. Yeah. And the only thing you let me do are like little snapshots on my, I'm not even allowed to have my phone. So like I, it's antiquated. It's an antiquated model. It's like a title and escrow business. It's yeah. like, you know, Grant, he was at my office like a month ago Yeah, and we were filming his show. Yeah. And he was talking about that. He was like, dude, when I was filming with Discovery, everything they do, it's so backwards. Yeah. It's like 30 year old, old technology. Yeah. And like He's the like, way they, they won't let me talk about it. I tell them to do this. I'm like, this is what's going to get it attention, but you don't want to listen. How are people going to like, it, it's almost like 
we can't talk about Tykes Summit until Tykes is live. Yeah. That's literally how it, how bad it is. Yeah. And it's like, well, how would people show up and how do people watch the show? And like, well, they'll know. They'll know in like the day before. Yeah. So what they want us to do is they want us to, pro what the show goes live and go, hey, hurry, go watch the shows live. It's like, guys, people are busy. Yeah. Why didn't we just prep them? Right. So it, it's, it's an interesting world and it's, it is amazing. It's opened up, up a lot of doors, but the balance I have, I'm very lucky. So when I got the show, the show came to me. They were, how did I get the show, by the way? Do you know? No. YouTube channel. Mm. I had 5,000 subscribers on my YouTube channel, guys, and I got a freaking TV show. <laughs> so like people that don't understand content, you just don't, you don't realize how powerful it really is. 5,000 YouTube subscribers. I posted a video of me walking through a, a, a hoarder house and I called all my students. I go, who wants to come and walk this property with me? And I had 30 people show up to this property. We walked this thing and a &E is like, we love that you brought the audience into your YouTube channel. Do you want to do a TV show like that? I go, yes. <laughs> and now our TV show is nothing like that. But that, that, was, <laughs> that was the original thought. So I go, yeah, that's all I want to do. I want to include everybody. I want to be all inclusive. I want everybody to invo be involved in everything. But um, that's how we got the, the, TV, the TV show. And um, five, can you freaking believe that I got a TV show off a 5,000 subscriber YouTube channel? They, they don't care. They're just like, right. So they, they come to me, we start negotiating and they go, who else do you, would you like to have on the show? And by that time I'd already called Jamil. I go, Hey, we, we got a TV show. And I go, my wife, I'm not doing this without my wife. And they go done. Is she, she doing a lot of listings for you? I go, yeah, she does my flips and she does whatever. And they go, okay, great. And they didn't pay her for the first season. Cause they were like, we're, we're not sure about this. So I didn't pay her for the first season. She crushed it. She did incredibly well. Now she's paid just as much as I am. And Rahima, Jamil brought Rahima in and we didn't, that was not the original intention of the show. The original intention was just Jamil and I, two competitors in Phoenix competing over the same deals uh. and then flipping them together and saying, let's not fight on this deal. Let's just do it together. Uh. And then we were like, no, we need more women representation. And I want to bring my wife in. And I told him, I go, guys, I can't balance any more work without my wife involved. Right. So I get to spend 20, 30 hours a week with my wife on set half the year. Mm. And so I spend more time with my wife than most people get to spend with their wife. Yeah, because you guys are working together. We're working together and there's a lot of dead time. And you guys know this, like you're, you guys are setting up shots all the time, switching out lenses, right? Cameras, blah, 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 blah. Let's get the lighting, da, da, da. So I get to hang out with my wife and talk with my kids. My kids are on set. So I get to spend so much time with them. Are you um, homeschooling them? I'm going, we're going to, yeah. Yeah. I've got a four-year-old and a, and a one-year-old now. Yeah. My 14-year-old is not my biological son, so I have no decision-making abilities, but I will never let my kids go into a public school. <laughs> well, especially, too, just with lifestyle. Bro, life, it's impossible. It's impossible. I have to drop you off at this time. I have to pick you up at this time. Yeah. I'm married to this, and there's a PTA conference, and da, 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 and the PTA conference gets canceled. The day yeah. uh, We had this thing with Asher like a year ago yeah. where I go to drop. We, uh, he has a parent-teacher conference. And I'm, Laura's like, it would really mean the world to me if you were there. I go, I'll be there. I canceled two speaking engagements to go to this PT, this parent teacher conference. And then they cancel it on me. Yeah. And I'm like, guys, no offense to you guys, but this, uh, this is not going to work for me. Yeah. I'm not going to be dictated. My life will not be dictated by your guys' like little mindsets. Yeah. That's, what about you guys? You guys going homeschool? Well, it's funny because if you watch my YouTube channel, like two years ago, my wife and I were like, we'll never homeschool freaking, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yes, it's still up. Anyone wants? It's because we all used to assume homeschoolers were freaking weird. Right. And now, a couple of things. Well, one, I grew up in public school. My yeah. wife was a public school teacher. Mm. Um, so we were all cool with public school. Well, as I got more famous, I'm like, all right, we'll send them to private school. Right. And now, the way I see it, when I see other entrepreneurs like homeschooling, yeah. not because of like necessarily the ideology, which also, like you mentioned, sucks too yeah but just like the lifestyle portion of it of it's like, impossible yeah dude if i'm trying to travel and grow like and i want to hang out with my kids more and like i'm just not gonna have a school tell me when we can go on vacation like, yeah that's, or that's like dumb. you can take your kids to the office like hey like my my daughter i just we i take her everywhere take her to speaking engagements she flies across the country with me it's like yeah. i never want that to stop i want to be able to hang out with my kids as much as possible i see like heather torres from think media you get yep. your friends with all them well heather's been telling Heather and Isaiah have been telling us to do it. Yeah. And she's like, let me talk to Mindy. Let me talk to Mindy. And then um, 
we haven't, we're, we're going to go to dinner together, but, uh, just one day out of the blue, uh, cause I just floated to Minnie cause she didn't want to do it. She's like, I don't want to the soft yeah. approach. Yeah. I'm like, you know, it was a bunt. Yeah. Home, <laughs> home school would kind of be cool in this way. I know that we've been against it, yeah. but you know, I had to do the same thing, bro. Yeah. My, so my wife, we have, so we have a nanny now. Two years ago, yeah, we finally we, we like just got a nanny. About it's a mindset four thing or five too. Months ago, should have gotten one five years ago. Yeah, yeah. It was a mindset thing. You had the money for it. It was a mindset thing. Yeah. And usually, it's for for the your wife has a mindset thing. Like, no, I need to do all the things. Yeah, that's how Mindy was. That's how it was with Laura too. So we hire um, Jerry Norton by by his house, and I go, yo, you, I need your landscaper. I need your pool guy. He goes, do you want my nanny too? I go, <laughs> I go, yes, I want your nanny. So we got Delaney, shout out Delaney. She's amazing. And I met their whole family and they have like seven kids, LDS family. And it's, so now we get to use the kids whenever we need. And they're all homeschooled and they're freaking not weird. In fact, they're freaking cool. Yeah. And so I'm like, babe, like, look at these people. They're regular human beings. This whole, like <laughs> this whole belief that they become lizards when they're homeschooled is not real. And so we're, uh, I, I think it's just recent I, well, things. I'm, yeah. And I think too, like that probably was true 20, 30 years For ago, sure. but today I think you're going to see homeschool as like a very normal choice, like for just normal people too, yeah. where they're like, dude, I'd rather my kids just learn from YouTube than deal with. That's what Heather's doing. Like she's, she's getting her kids in classes and courses. Her kids were like watching my course. Dude. I mean, it's better. You'll learn way more. Like, how to balance your checkbook, how to put your yeah. LLC together, how to do this. Like, what is an LLC? Why do I need an LLC? Why should it, but the, all these things you don't learn until you're like 25 yeah. and you've ran your business incorrectly for four years ago. <laughs> oh, wait. Where's I, all my money? <laughs> where's all my money? <laughs> Why am I broke? I don't exactly. get it. I thought I made all this money. Exactly. So Heather's right. And so I, I had a conversation with Heather last time you and I saw each other was at um, Sean Cannell's event. Yep. And she told me the same thing. She's like, you got to get on the wagon, dude. And I went home and I go, I talked to, I talked to, um, Heather, sweetheart. I think we're going to move forward with this. And she's like, all right, I'm on board. Shout out to Heather. We're going to Heather. He Heather, shout this. out. Yeah. We're going to, um, and Jerry Norton's been doing it for a long time. They have 10 kids. They're all homes. <laughs> yes. 10 freaking kids. He if has have, 10 success stories. Well, if you have 10 kids though, I think at that point you have an entire classroom. Yes. Like you're, you're, and he has a classroom in his house. Yes. It, well, I now, turned, now I turned it into a playroom. There's <laughs> okay. like a, a, a pool table and like a, a pin, pinball machine and stuff. I'm like, we don't need a classroom in here. So, <laughs> but yeah, they had a legit classroom in yeah. the house. So what do you think has made it so successful? I mean, you guys are brand new. You're not really acting, but mm. you know, just like, I mean, you, I'll tell you, you guys are new TV people. Like, why is it so successful? You think? I think it's successful because um, it's a little bit different than what other people are doing. We're actually showing people where the deals are coming from. Mm. So, like, Jim, la last week's episode was a door knocking session. I close a seller live, which was all legit. Mm. And so, people are DMing me like, "Dude, I just found you on Triple Digit Flip. I've never seen a show actually show people where these deals come from. Oh my gosh, I just had this epiphany." Yeah, they just have the house already. Right, they have the house already. And for me, I think that's another reason why I had a hard time when I was a contractor. I was like, "Yeah, these just I guess these people just have these houses to flip. I don't know what's going on." <laughs> they just magically appear and, you know, I'm here to fix it. Right. So Jamil and I play a lot of games like I'll go, "Okay, I'm taking you door knocking." And we'll go door knock and the first person to say anchovy to the seller at the door, like gets 500 bucks, not 500 bucks. We gets to choose lunch and we just have a blast doing it. Is it a hundred percent authentic to what we do in our business? No, but it's authentic to our relationship and what we do on the road all the time. Right. Um, everything is legit. All the numbers are legit, which I'm very proud of, but there are moments where you guys will never see this, where like I'll walk into a house with Laura, my wife and it, the camera will turn around to a different camera angle and it'll come back to us. And you'll assume that's the same exact day in the same exact shot. Right. And it's not. Right. What happens is they're like, we, the lighting wasn't right. The audio kind of screwed up. We need you to put the same clothes on and we need you to do that 13 second thing one more time. Oh my gosh. Bro, that is the how, hard. How hard is it to, to film? Like compared to, you know, we go on social media, we're like, hey, you know, whatever yeah, happened, you, happened. You script, right? You, you, okay, this is what my audience is asking me to provide. So I'm going to script it together. So my audience gets the value and I answer that question with them. It's not that way. There's an invisible person I've never talked to at a &E that tells, like, we don't like that. Yeah. And they'll say, well, ultimately what we learned too, I learned at the end of the show, they film 80 hours of content to produce 42 minutes of a show. Wow. 
So what happens is you're getting angles and angles and angles. They've got three cameramen. They've got all this stuff. Ultimately, to produce 42 minutes of a television show, it's 80 hours of recorded content. Well, and not to mention, too, this is over a huge period of time. because Seven months, yeah. Well, yeah, because you buy the house and then, Mm -hmm. you know, you got to renovate it and everything else. I think the hardest part, to be honest with you, from a flipper to flipper conversation is that before the TV show starts, guess what we have to do? We have to hoard properties and sit on them. Oh, (laughs) yeah. And you got to just pay out of pocket. Because it's not it's not like the TV show goes, hey, tell us when you're ready. Tell us when they're like, we're filming this day. So you need 12 houses on deck. I got an email for uh, season two, just like five hours ago. And they go, uh. Principal photography starts February on, or not February, January 2nd. Yeah. And so they're like, have your houses ready. So what are we doing right now? We're accumulating our houses and we're putting the lo- best ones for the show. And best ones for the show. What'll happen is we'll go by 20, Ryan, and they'll reject 10 of them. <laughs> hey, but you know what though? I will say this. Great time to do it because they're appreciating. They are. So that's the crazy thing. You might get screwed though later. (laughs) I know. I'm like hoping in like season four or five, we don't like, it doesn't have the opposite effect. And if it does, it'll be great TV. But like, there's been moments where we go, you know, there's a couple of things that we'll spend a little bit more money on in Phoenix. I don't know about it in Vegas. I imagine it's pretty similar. You guys probably don't do too much landscape here. Uh, It just depends on the price point. Like for us, dirt backyards are perfectly fine. Yeah, we do that on entry level all the time. Right, entry level, anything at like three fifty or lower, dirt backyard. Yeah, no, is we fine. Ain't, yeah, we ain't doing that. Right, the TV show's not okay with that. They're like, dude, you need to put a pool in. Well, not <laughs> not to that extent, but they're like, you guys need to stage it. You need to do this. We can't have an ugly dirt backyard. And I'm like, makes sense. It totally makes sense. So outside of those little things, they keep it ninety nine point nine percent authentic to exactly what we're actually doing, which I'm very grateful for. I think the biggest part I was frustrated about, and we talked about this pre-show, is that I want to tell everybody the real nitty gritty. Like, right. we bought it for this, our hard money costs this, our monthly payments of utilities and expenses and blah, 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 were this, our, our buyer asked for concessions, our buyer asked for closing costs, our buyer asked for this. They can't t- tell the audience that. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's not good TV. I was a contractor doing thousands of flips and I didn't know what hard money was. Right. So it's not great for people to get overwhelmed with a TV show on Fix and Flip where you're talking about hard money. There's words that they eradicated from our, our um, vocabulary. I, we stopped saying the word primary bedroom. or I'm sorry, not I, we say primary bedroom. We can't say master anymore. Why? Oh, like slave stuff? Slave stuff. So master, <laughs> master bedroom, master bathroom. So what would happen is we would have, this is like that 0.1%. Yeah. People would come through the house authentically. All of it's authentic. And then on camera, they would go, man, the master bathroom is gorgeous. We would have to stop and go, we need you to say that again, but you have to say primary bath. Yeah, so dumb. It's it's interesting, right? So those are the big differences. I think the hardest thing, Ryan, is that when we were about to go into the TV show, I was texting you about this, and I was like, man, I don't know how this is going to go. You're like, it's going to work out great. There's going to be benefits, you know, all that kind of stuff. They control your life. Yeah. Because you, like, they, cameras show up, Cameras are turning on. You better have all your guys there. What if your guys get sick? What if, right? All of those types of things. There's challenges and you get a new schedule every day. It's not like be on set at seven, you're done at five. It's like be on set at seven. We'll finish when we finish. We'll finish when we finish. Yeah. And so when- I've seen you post where you're like, dude, I just got off set. It's like two in the morning. Yeah, it's crazy stuff. That's nuts. Or or like they say, we're going to finish in August and we ended up finishing first week in November. Right. So you want to plan family trips. You want to go do that? That's why we, I were, just, we were supposed to speak at the same event in Mexico, and you couldn't go. Right. Yeah. I And I had people so upset. I ended yeah. up and going to North Carolina and meeting Terry face-to-face and like having a conversation about him with it because it was something I was really excited about. I yeah. was promoting it. He said that there was a lot of people that went to that event specifically to – 99% of them came for Ryan Pineda, but <laughs> 1% of them came for me, and they were like, where's Pace? I came yeah. here for Pace. And Terry's like – I'm like, Terry, I had to send him screenshots and I had to send him emails and go, bro, I'm not doing this on purpose. I have no control over my schedule. Right. So it's been challenging. Um, I've had to er work earlier in the morning, work weekends, which um, has been a bigger challenge. But the good thing is I'm with my wife and kids all the time. Right. The only thing I do is work and hang out with my wife and kids. And they're kind of the same thing now. They're the same thing for the next couple of years. Yeah. And that's another thing too, like, Do you want to bring your wife and kids into your social media presence to that degree? I don't know. Right. Like, do you try and keep those those two worlds separate? You know, for me, it's interesting. Um, 
my wife and I have done some stuff together. We used to do a YouTube series called The R&M Show, where we would just sit there and talk about just like things that married couples... Uh, I don't think I ever do. saw that. The well, only it, one I saw was you and your wife talking about your house. Yeah, so I'll bring her on for those types of things right. randomly. But um, we did one... I think this was... We probably filmed like 15 YouTube videos. It's on my main channel. For anyone, I'll link to them down below. But uh, we just sat on our couch in our house, and we just discussed topics. Like we talked about... Uh, what do we think about homeschooling? What oh, do we think it. about, uh, you know, spending money as a couple and joint bank account? Like just these things, couples I think would want to know. It, and it really had nothing to do with real estate or anything. Right, right. But uh, she enjoyed it, and she's good on camera, and she actually edited it because she's like, "Hey, if this is me, I need to edit it." Right, right, right. Um, but at the same time, too, you know, I recently released a YouTube video about a house we just bought. It's this uh, house we paid one point eight million for. It's going to be worth $3 million when we're done, and we're thinking about moving into it until our house is built. Oh, yeah, because your house is going to take a while, bro. Yeah, it's going to take a while. And so I'm like, dude, maybe this is the first flip where I'm like, hey, I would live in this. This mm -hmm. house is tight. It's actually a brand new house that um, the guy quit 95% of the oh, way Oh, I there. saw this. I saw, yeah, yeah, I saw this, yeah. So I, I just filmed the behind the scenes of um, us walking through it with my contractor and interior designer and stuff. And Mindy's really critical of the house because she's like, hey, if I'm going to live here, here's what I want. Because you should have, at least like for us anyways, if you're going to spend a $3 million house, it should be the way you want, in right. my opinion. Right, right. Um, but also, too, we already live in a great house. Like, we don't have to move. So long story short, people in the comments were hating on her because they're like, dude, she is stuck up. She's, you know, just uh, high maintenance and That's blah, tough. blah, blah. And it's like, hey, on one hand, I could see how people might perceive that because if you just take that clip, you're like, oh, man, like... She wants like everything just perfect. But on the other hand, when you understand the context of, well, we already live in a great house. We don't mm -hmm. have to move. Right. We're going to move again in three years if our house is built. Um, and this is a really expensive home. If I have an expensive that's, home, I want a house like perfect. That's all great context that people are obviously missing. But the context that they're really missing is the fact that when you were couch flipping, right? And you were yeah. hustling and you go pick up that truck for 1500 bucks. Yep. That whole story, your wife was by, by your side the whole freaking time. Yep. I think that's the opposite of entitled. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? For but sure. people well, don't. And also part of the credit cards I maxed out were hers. Boom. <laughs> Boom. Are you yeah. kidding me? So that's the big thing that people don't understand. And there is a point where your wife and yourself and anybody else that reaches a level of success should say, this is what I'm will. These are my standards. Yeah. You don't just always say stay at this level, guys. You got to upgrade your mindset for heaven's sakes. Yeah. So that was kind of, you know, to get to the the whole story of that is like, I do include her. I include my kids and mm -hmm. stuff. And, you know, it remains to be seen how much I want to include them going forward. Right. Um, we've talked about creating like a family channel and not even for like content. Cause like, I don't think it will be worthwhile time-wise to go create a family channel, but more so to document like our life so that our kids have this going, you know, like the family trips and Hey, if anyone wants to watch it, cool. But really it's for us, basically our I, family. I home thought videos. about that the other day, like you and I both make enough, enough money that you could hire somebody to basically document your family. I'm sitting there going to Disneyland. We're doing all these things. And I'm sitting there clicking at my wife, like, turn on the camera, yeah. record, record Corbin. She's saying something hilarious. Record it, record it, record it. It's like, man, those moments and, um, you know, the things that you're doing in your daily life, you're not documenting them enough. And at some point, you're going to look back and go, man, we didn't take enough videos. We didn't take enough photos. Right. We didn't tell the stories the way that they happened. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So that's something we're thinking about. And that would just be, dude. We're not trying to like make this the best uh, right. channel. Like everything else is like, hey, this is a business. Like let's really do it the best. But this is more for fun. Right. We, and I think that. I think if the TV show that we're doing did not involve my wife and kids, I would have had a hard, really hard time committing to it. So when yeah, they were, that time commitment is crazy. It's it, it would be it would have been impossible. My wife and I wouldn't have seen each other. It would have been hard. But it, we went the opposite direction where A and E says, okay, well, how do you guys envision the show? I yeah. go, well, my wife is my realtor anyway. So why don't we bring her into the show? And Jamil's sister is his project manager. Really? Why don't we bring them into the show? And now we can spend way more time with our families. Right. And it worked out amazing. And my wife did a great job and she's having a good time. I think she's found a level of self-confidence, like being on camera that she didn't have. Like your yeah. wife is phenomenal and she's hilarious, by the way. <laughs> she's so funny. Um, and so just getting them in front of the camera, allowing them to be themselves has been a lot of fun, you know? Yeah, no, 100%. You know, I was going to ask you, your work schedule, man, is is absolutely crazy. I mm -hmm. mean, you work 16 hours a day. Yeah. And for me, I've always been about, hey, guys, I'm not going to work a lot. Like, my whole deal is let's just 
optimize everything, only do the things that I really want to do. Right. And you now for you, you love doing everything you do. I do. And so it's like, how do you, do you, I guess I have two questions. Like for one, I was going to ask you, how does your family handle that? But like you just said, a lot of that work is with them. Yeah. Um, but two, do you see yourself slowing down at some point? Yeah, I'm already, so this is a great topic mm-hmm. because you are at a level where I want to be. Okay. In terms of, you know, I'm, I'm, you slow down and you structure your days. I'm structuring my day. Most of my work, people are going to throw up when they hear this, but most of my work is done between two 30 in the morning and seven o'clock in the morning. Dude, you text me at two this morning. I thought you woke up at night. No, no, no. I, I, that, that was, I thought you just like went to the, go to the bathroom, but that was you like waking up. I'm done. I'm showered. I'm, I'm raring to go. <laughs> okay. Okay. Because <laughs> you, you know, you talked about this. It's the sling, the slingshot, the slingshot effect with your buddy um, Acuff was talking about in the morning and in the night, those are the two most critical parts of your day. Right. So for me, it's the only time where people don't need something from me and I can actually focus on reading books and planning up my day, emptying my email, replying back to everybody, going through my Slack channel, you know, all of our companies. I don't have as many companies as you, but I'm a couple shy of you. And I go through all my Slack channels, reply to everybody, do videos, do all that kind of stuff. And then I'm ready to start my day. Mm. And so when people are like, man, you haven't looked at your phone for five hours. I'm like, yeah, cause I did all my texting. I did my emailing. I did all my messaging early in the morning. I'm done. Now I can focus on what I'm doing. And so it's always been like that for me. Um, but now what's happening is in the afternoons I'm, I'm done. Like I end early. I don't go till nine, 10 o'clock at night. Like I used to. And now business opportunities come to me and guess what I'm saying to them? No, no, not you interested. Don't need it. I don't need it. Yeah. But two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, when these things happened to me and I had to rebuild my, my whole company You're structure, like I'll do whatever I had to go. And you, you yeah. went very vertical in your business where it's like, okay, I'm fixing and flipping. Well, now I'm running into, you know, re- handling books and accounting and financing. And I have a lot of buddies that are running into that issue too. I'm going to start my, my CPA firm. Yeah. I'm going to start my brokerage. I'm going to do this. Yeah. There's a point where you have enough of that. And when one thing rises, the other ones rise as well. I'm at a point right now with our title company, our virtual assistant company, all the things that we own that I'm like, I, this is a perfect setup. Yeah. At some point, I think after the TV show, I'm probably going to be like Brent Daniels. Do you know Brent Daniels' schedule? No, I don't. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, done. That's it. Doesn't work Monday, doesn't work Friday, doesn't work Sunday, mm. Sa- Saturday or Sunday. That's a good schedule. You can barely get a hold of him. <laughs> He's just like, I'm off the grid. So we do a podcast. Like we'll have, we have a podcast here shortly, um, Wholesale Hotline. And he comes into the studio on Mondays just for that. Mm. And then he goes home. His team runs everything, right? He's figured out what works for him. And I think that goes down to is like, what is what do you actually want? Yeah. Right? You figured out exactly what you want. I think I'm at that point of knowing exactly what I want. And I have just about everything. Now it's at a point of just keeping it efficient yeah, and hiring better people, right? We talked earlier, like there's certain things in my media company and my brand that I want to, you know, hire a couple more people and then I'm done hiring. Like I have everything yeah, I need. Just get those A players and let them, let them run it. Yes. Better than you and I could ever do it. So, yeah. um, my schedule is two o'clock in the morning, usually crazy. I know, um, all the way until about six or seven o'clock at night, Monday through Thursday. And then Friday, Saturday, Sunday are like half days for me. When do you go to sleep? 10. So you sleep four hours a night. Four hours a night, yeah. You're like Kobe Bryant, dude. You ever hear Kobe's story? Yeah, it's crazy. Like people, yeah. like people going down to the gym, and he's already like not just done. He's like showered and done. Yeah, but I mean, like that—that that was his whole deal. He would like wake up at two, three in the morning, and he's at the gym at four, just right. ready to crush. And I think we're <laughs> like you and I are very lucky. I think what people need to understand about real estate is that it's kind of like going back to high school or even playing baseball. Like you looked forward to baseball, yes, because you love the sport, right? But you also had a lot of buddies in it. Yep. And you look forward to hanging out with your buddies. For me, I look at real estate as my sport that I get to hang out with all my buddies. Yeah, it's not work. You no, enjoy it. We enjoy it. We both yeah. do. Now, I'm very lucky. My wife is my realtor, so I talk to her 10 times a day. And we have a great relationship. She's amazing at what she does. So I don't ever feel like there's a disconnect of like, I'm sacrificing work to be with my family. And I think that I'm lucky in that regard. Right. Other people don't have that. No. Yeah, because their they're family's in something totally separate. And- right. Yeah. No, I, I've always been curious, man, because, you know, I see you on the live streams. Mm-hmm. I see you, you know, filming the show, obviously still running your existing businesses, right. running your education. I'm like, holy cow, this dude, like, does he, uh, is it like the Harry Potter thing where, you know, he's got that thing that <laughs> makes two of him and then 
He I can manipulate time. I, so I'm not at your level yet, but I feel like my delegation yeah. is probably 85, 90% of where you, you're at. And I have, like, this morning as I was driving up here, I drove because I wanted to, I'm driving to um, Reno to buy another house. And I'm voice texting everybody. Like, yeah. 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm voice texting everybody. I've got people on the East Coast that work for me. I purposely had my has, have my bookkeeper and my media manager work both on the East Coast so that when I'm up at 5, it's They're 8 up. o'clock their time. Yeah. So I've structured my life that at 5 o'clock, I can get a lot of stuff done. And um, it used to not be that way. I would sit there and just an- be antsy, like, wake up, guys, let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Get on my level, come on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think uh, the moral of the story is, like, to be successful, you got to figure out what works for you. Right. You know, I- I've seen this happen so many times. Like, people are like, uh, man, what's the best time to uh, work out? And I'm like, honestly, the best time to work out is freaking when you're going to do it the most consistent. <laughs> Such a great point. You look like, at, like, Brent Daniels does it at noon. Yeah, look, noon is a weird time to work out in the middle of the workday, but hey, if you get it done at noon, do it. For me, it's always been the morning. I just want to get it out of my way. Right. There are some people who are like, oh, well, you you know, your testosterone levels are up at night and this. I'm like, hey, if Bro, that's if what you want. I'm going to overthink to that level, I'm not going to do it. Well, it's just like, hey, for some people, if that's when you feel good, do it. I don't really freaking care. Right. If you want to wake up at 2 in the morning and that's how you get your alone time, perfect. One thing, though, I do believe is that everyone needs – that consistent alone time in the morning. Yes. And for you, you get it at two in the morning. For me, I get it waking up at six. Like right. just whatever works for some people. They got, they say a lot of people be like, yo, I have kids. I got to take them to school. I'm like, well, wake up an hour earlier. Like it ain't rocket science. It's crazy to <laughs> me that it's that rudimentary and people just won't do it. It's like, you should be up showered, ready to go before your kids, because you need to lead by lead by example. First and foremost, like you shouldn't be clamoring to get to your kid's bedroom at seven o'clock. Hey, get up, get out of bed. Yeah. You should be up and raring to go. Like this morning I had, I was stressed out yesterday, like super stressed out about one topic. I was like, okay, the topic was, and we talked about it earlier. I was texting Alex Hermosi, who you're, you know, b- both you and I are friendly with and a couple of our other friends. And I was like, what is the solution to get people to take true action? Yeah. Is there a pill? Like, is there, is it like a red pill or a blue pill? You take the blue pill, you're an action taker. You take the red pill, you're just lazy. What is the f- easiest way to get people to act, take actual action? So this morning I read an entire book. I didn't write, read it. I listened to an audio, uh, like an yeah. audio book. For four and a half hours, I listened to a book. Most people don't have any time in their day because they wake up right when their kids wake up. They right. come home from dinner and they turn on. What, your buddy Acuff talked about the average American watches 35 hours of TV a week. Yeah. As long as, you know, part of that is triple digit flip. It's yeah, fine. exactly. But, you know, there you go. other than that, that's yes. too much. Yes. So now I'm with you, dude. Like people need to really just, it, it, we all have 24 hours. That's the point right. I'm, I'm making is like, dude, you choose to s- sleep four mm-hmm. and wake up at two and you have a very successful life. Your family is seeing you like you've built your life in a way where like, hey, I work with my family mm-hmm. so I can work more. I love to work. Like, it's not like I'm forced. I have enough money. I just want to do it. Same thing with me. It's like, dude, my family, I don't want to work with them. Like, you know, they want to do their thing. I'll play with my friends in real estate and then I'll come home. Right. And uh, Brent Daniels, same way. Three days a week, dude, tight. I freaking love it. It's amazing. And I think I tell him all the time, I'm heading down that path, but I'm not quite there yet. Yeah. I mean, I was five days a week for a long time, but now I started golfing every Friday. And so now I'm four days a week. Right. And so it's like, man, that actually makes me more efficient because I'm like, Hey, it's not like I stopped doing things. Right. I still have my normal things I need to get done. And so I'm super like, we were supposed to have lunch today. And I was like, dude, I got to film four YouTube videos plus film this podcast today. Right. 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 Or, you know, I'm just not going to get what I need to get done today. And so, um, it, it makes you think like, man, how can I accomplish all my goals? in this limited amount of time. Yeah, you got to be around. The thing is, you got to be around people that are also doing these types of things, right? I, I told, you know, we've got Kevin here in the studio, young young guy, 20. How old are you, Kevin? 21 years old. Oh, my gosh. If you if I could rub shoulders with a Ryan Pineda when I was 21 freaking years old, just being around the energy of somebody who's so specific about what they want in their life is unbelievable, which, anyway, going back to like the time machine and why I didn't fix and flip. It's like, because I was around the wrong freaking people and I was learning the wrong information from people that wanted to control what my, you know, capabilities were. So dude, it's, it's been amazing watching you from two years ago 
And it's amazing that you gave me the time and energy this afternoon to tell me like what your plans are, because I realized also when we were sitting down, I go, Ryan, like I have a little bit of FOMO every time I look at what Ryan's doing. <laughs> everybody, I th- I'm sure everybody does. And I go, Ryan has what Ryan wants. I don't want what Ryan has. Yep, exactly. You guys have to be very specific about that in your life. Like I, when we took a break, I go, bro, this guy is on another level. He's unbelievable, but he has things that I don't want. Yep. I want the, and he, I have things he doesn't want where our job is just to elevate each other and be around each other and share wisdom and take bits and pieces along the way. Yeah. Yeah. And for anyone listening, you know, we were talking pre-show for about an hour, just about why and mission and, you know, just really hammering those things home of like, why, why would I create more content? Like, what's the point? Why would I start a new business? Like it has to meet the greater why of what we're doing. And, you know, if we know our time is just very limited. It mm. is. It's the only limitation we have. We can go get more money. We can get more people. We can get, you know, all these things. But, you know, time is the only limited resource. It's like, man, it makes saying no to things very easy yes. when you filter them through. Hey, does this line up with my why? Right. No. Like 99% of the things do not. Right. And so it's just like, okay, you know. Yeah, I, I spend more of my time now saying no to just about everything. Yeah. Even speaking engagements and other things, requests, I'm sure you do too. You get people asking you all the time, fly all over the country. Like, no. Yeah. Like, that's time away from my businesses. That's time away from my wife and my kids. That's not, like, in alignment with my purpose. So you end up getting to a level, you know, through real estate. Just like yep. you said earlier, real estate is the tool that allows you to get into these spaces. Yep. Once you're in these spaces, you spend 99% of the time saying no. Exactly. 100%. Thanks for making us to the end. The good news is I've got another one that I know you're going to like, and all you got to do is click it right here, linking it right here. All you got to do is just click it and you're going to see this new episode that you're going to love. I, I, don't, I don't understand how Instagram works, but like you, I'm consistent and committed and it works out. Maybe I'm a little spoiled. Um, I have almost 200,000 followers on Instagram. I want more. <laughs> and you get spoiled because I have the TikTok numbers. We're almost at 2.8 million. And then I go to Instagram where it's everything's slower. It's like being on another planet, like yeah. slow planet.